Hey, how's it going, everybody? We are here for another episode of Heavy Art Talk. I am honored and extremely excited to have Shindy Rehal on the stream today. And uh, man, you guys got to check out his work. Um, so he's been doing a lot of work with a lot of the technical death metal bands of late, but you've definitely seen like his album art. You've seen his t-shirt illustrations. I happen to be wearing one of his Art Spire shirts now, inspired by Terminator which uh, really just screamed at me from the, um, you know, merch stand at the show. But basically, before I get him on here, I just want to give you a short bio. And if you guys can, um, first of all, I'm just really grateful for everybody who's been tuning in, you know, every week or every couple of weeks. I'm really aiming to do about three of these a month. And uh, it's really been great so far. I've met a lot of cool friends from it. I've had a lot of repeat viewers, even though the channel is small, it feels intimate and it's kind of exactly what I want. And of course I want it to be bigger, but a lot of it is people coming back time and time again. And I'm just really appreciative to everyone who's doing that and kind of along for the conversation. So if you can like, and subscribe, that's greatly appreciated. Uh, of course, check out my stuff on Instagram, uh, it'd be my personal work. And then also just letting you guys know when new episodes are coming out. And if you haven't been able to tell, I'm at a new location. Uh, my wife and I, we recently bought a house, so it's pretty exciting, but there's a lot of work that of course comes with that. And uh, it did slow down the show just a little bit, but I have enough in the backlog that I should be able to do about two to three shows a month. Um, so back on topic, Shindy. Uh, he also goes by Shindy Design on Instagram. He's a self-trot illustrator and graphic artist um, who spent a lot of time in London, but I believe now is in the uh, South Somerset area of the UK. Uh, he creates really detailed illustrations that have a great balance of graphic design plus extremely well executed chops. Uh, he has a great sense of anatomy and realism, but he knows when to stylize it, which really draws me in. Uh, he can really do things well black and white, color is extremely versatile and to hear that he is self-taught is uh, extremely inspiring to me as i would be classified in that way as well um, you can see a lot of his stuff draws from that sense of like the beauty of the female figure but has a dark element as well and he um, has done a lot of work with zenith passage uh, arch spire uh, among a lot of other bands that I'm just not remembering off the top of my head, Trader. He's even done some stuff with Sepultura. Um, but a lot of his work, it battles with mental health, spiritual struggles, and then it also has an adoration of nature and uh, death. And I think you'll be able to see that. So in terms of the segments for today, we got just chit-chat with Shindy. Then we're going to do some picks of artists that he is inspired by. And then we're going to tackle some of his artwork and look in roughly like a two hour, two and a half hour uh, episode. But yeah, without further ado, let me let Shindy in here. Hey. Hey, how's it going? Very good, thanks. Uh, beautiful intro. Uh, far too kind. And I'm totally getting on your process syndrome right now. But I appreciate it. Thanks for uh, taking the time. I'm really excited for this. You know, it's funny because this is my first time doing that. I wasn't sure if you were able to even hear it. So I was just like, is he going to yeah. come in blind? I could hear all of it and I'm just blushing and just cr almost cringing on the inside. But not because of anything you've said, just because, you know, we all self-deprecate in this sort of business. And it's hard to take stock and just, you know, take compliments and just be like, yeah, I am awesome. It's, you know, no one's going to yeah. do that. But I really appreciate it. And um yeah, just really stoked to have a conversation with you. The conversations you've had so far, um, I've really enjoyed, like with Riddick, Sawblade, uh, Nightjar. It's been really cool, uh, really nice format, just really relaxed and chilled. So, yeah, stoked, dude. Thanks again. Yeah, of course, man. Um, and, yeah, as far as, you know, this two hours, you'll probably get some praise. You're just going to have to deal with it. Maybe it'll yeah. boost your confidence a little bit, but it will keep coming. And it's coming from a sincere place, man, because, like, the way I see it is – being an artist is kind of a lonely occupation and to actually have a lot of, you know, actual face to face type interactions with artists isn't that common. I've realized even with really esteemed artists. So that's kind of what I hope people get. Out of this is not only listening into other episodes and hearing other people sharing a lot of the same challenges, um, but also like if I can do anything to 
help out the artists in the scene, just even feeling better about their own work. I think it's a win all across the board. Um, but, you know, onto something a little lighter just to start out, man. So South Somerset, where is that exactly in the UK? I looked it up on Google Maps. It looked kind of near Bath and Bristol. Is that about right? Yeah, so I'm uh, I'm an hour away from Bristol. Um, okay. I'm kind of a bit further south into the countryside. Um, I lived in Bristol before uh, for a couple of years. Before that, I grew up in London, um, so very used to the sort of city vibes. And as I got older, I just kind of needed to get away from all the distractions of city life and uh, just my background. And I love it. I love being in the country. But yeah, that's that's pretty much where I am, yeah. Nice. Yeah. I, um, so I've been to the UK once. It was in like 2018. It actually was the uh, trip where I, I proposed to my girlfriend, who's now my now wife. But um, I went to London and then I went to Bath. And I went to Bath. I was trying to get something just a little more. I mean, I know it's kind of touristy, but just something a little more historic, like, local oriented. And yeah, historic. Because, hmm. yeah, they have the, the Roman baths. But yeah, yeah. Um, when I looked on the map, I saw that you were kind of close to there and pretty cool. Yeah, it's nice. It's a nice area. You know, people are just more friendlier. Um, yeah. And it's just less chaotic. I think, you know, when you, when I was growing up in the sea, I kind of felt that maybe I needed the chaos and that I thrived on it. And it was really conducive to what I did as an illustrator. But I actually realized I'm, it's way more conducive just to have some peace and quiet and just live in a quiet town. It's just. My mind is just way more at ease. Um, so I, I don't think I'd ever go back to the city. I, I really do love it in the country now. And so does my partner. She's got family here and everything. So we've kind of made our roots here now. So that's awesome. Nice. W where did you move out? Uh, from? From London to the country now. So, yeah, I was pretty much uh, just outside London, so southwest. And then I met my partner. We lived in Bristol for a couple of years. And so I'm in a very small town called Wincanton. You wouldn't have heard of it, but um, there's not really much here. It's like I say, it's just really idyllically quiet and boring and ordinary. <laughs> and I just really like that. Yeah. <laughs> there's no shows or anything. That's the only thing. So in terms of like metal shows, I'd have to go into Bristol. That's where like all the action is with that. And, you know, the art scene there is actually really great. So I still you know, dip my toes into that for sure. I don't like to be totally, you know, reclusive or anything like that. Yeah, nice. Have you been to the States at all? I have when I was super young. I've actually got uh, some relatives that live in uh, Florida. Um, okay. So I was there when I was like 15, 16, but because I was so young, I didn't really get to entrench myself into the culture or, you know, go out and do much. It was very touristy, sort of kitty stuff during the days. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Were you like around know. Orlando? Yeah, Orlando for sure. Uh, Jacksonville is actually the town that my my, relative, my uncle lives in. Okay. So it's just around that sort of area. But I did visit North Carolina for a small segment of that holiday. Um, okay. That was way more my style. Just beautiful, beautiful countryside, mountains and woods. Oh, it's just stunning. I'd love to go back. Yeah, you're probably around uh, Appalachia. So there's the Appalachian Mountains that go up. Uh, they start mm. in Georgia. So I live in Atlanta, which, you know, you got North Carolina here. Jacksonville's kind of on the, um, what, east side of the coast. So okay. I'm kind of in between there. But Atlanta's a, a pretty cool place, uh, extremely diverse. Um, There's a great music scene in Atlanta, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, so the big name would be Macedon for metal. Mm. Um, but then there's a really thriving underground scene as well. Um, let's see. I mean, there's so many bands. Um, Sadistic Ritual, Father Befouled. Um, a lot of kind of actually darker kind of like blackened bands. Uh, a band mm -hmm. called Cloak. They're from here. So they're kind of like a black and roll type. Almost kind of sound a little like Tribulation. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's got a really good music scene. Lots of venues and... Um, it, it's kind of similar to Austin, Texas, if you're familiar at all, where okay. it's um, a more liberal-minded city and a very conservative state. So it has that okay. kind of parallel. Um, were, were they from Austin, Texas, Power Trip? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure they were from Austin, but they're definitely Texas. Okay, cool. Yeah. Texas probably has the best metal scene right now, frankly, in terms of bands coming out. 
It's crazy, uh, yeah. Especially for that old school death, like thrashy, you know, really grimy, almost crusty sound for sure. I mean, you've, I, I can already tell you've got a very encyclopedic knowledge of metal and, you know, kind of like um, obscure metal for sure, way more than me. But um, yeah, it's just, it's cool. I could, I could talk for hours about bands and stuff like that, but I definitely, a lot of the stuff you've mentioned already is just a bit over my head, but I'll try and chime in where I can. <laughs> oh, it's, it's fine, you know. I just have all these CDs just to flex. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> They're all but, like uh, and, uh, and Britney Spears on the inside. You've just got all the covers. Just to... Well, hey, man. I mean, if I recall right on Instagram, you posted that uh, it was your birthday recently. I think you're right around the same age as me. So I'm, I just turned 32 not that long ago. Oh, cool. You're, you're right around there, right? Uh, I'm 35 now. Same, we still are the same generation. And I'm sure oh. we had a lot of like that same y2k you know kind of stuff filtering in there right so yeah it was yeah. you know like my first cd i think was the spice girls and then it just got heavier and ridiculous from there yeah yeah well over here man it was in sync and backstreet boys yeah, that's it, yeah. whether i like it or not man no strings attached and black and blue were technically my first cds and by <laughs> and by saying this i've already lost half my subscribers but I think it led Zeppelin ACDC shortly after that. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of like, you know, people that try and make out they're super true and like they were always into metal, but yeah. come on, you've all got to start somewhere. You know, when you're little kids, you're not ex exposed to, you know, like the dungeons of really obscure metal and avant-garde music, you know, it is just the stuff you hear on the radio and, and then, then you find your own personality, of course, don't you? And, you know, you find friends in school that, you know, show you onto stuff, but yeah, we've all got guilty pleasures for sure. Yeah. Um, so talking a little bit about art then, as my dog just shuffles down the hallway. Um, how did it start for you? Like, um, were you drawing at like a really young age? What was kind of your inspiration at the time? Yeah, from a very young age, actually. So, I mean, for as long as I can remember, I was just doodling stuff, you know, incoherently. But then... Um, so I touched on it, I've touched on it before, but it was mainly comics and uh, record covers that my dad has. Um, so there was that, and there's also, I, I don't wanna get too deep and dark, but there's a lot of trauma that I went through as a kid. So I was then just naturally drawn to dark subject matter. Mm -hmm. And in, as a form of escapism, I found that, you know, reading comics and just drawing was just, just probably the healthiest escapism that I could find. So. I, in that sense, I've definitely had a very good head start in terms of drawing and, you know, just understanding visuals and um, just nerding out with, like, comics and literature and stuff like that. But it did come from a place of, you know, I was so obsessed about it because I was thrown into it so much. It yeah. was just a, a way for me to just to cancel out everything else that was going on around me. But um, the positive side of it is, like, obviously I've got a good understanding of what i really like from you know from a very very young age i knew i liked dark art there was always something about it that i, that I could relate to but um so it was that it was essentially escapism uh, looking at you know rock covers just the the crazy detailed paintings you'd get on these like war of the worlds was one of them when i was super young i saw that cover and I was just blown away. And, you, you know, you could tell it was painted. I don't know if it was airbrushed and acrylics or whatever, but that was just so sick. And then, you know, you opened it up and it was like a ritual and you were just thrown into this world of inlay art and it told a story and it had all the, the text that told the story as well. And just, so yeah, records and comics essentially. So that was from, I want to say from about as early as six to eight years old, I was already pretty obsessed and just, just loving it. And I just never stopped from there. I just uh, copied a lot of uh, frames in like Batman comics and stuff like that. Um, I think at the time as well, I can't remember what the earliest Batman film was when I was a kid. Obviously, the first Tim Burton film, I was only just born. So yeah. I think it would have been Batman Forever or something like that. Mm -hmm. Which now, when you look at it, is obviously just one of the most cringiest films ever. <laughs> Pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. <But> all, the, <laughs> all the promo imagery that I just saw everywhere was just sort of like, you know, my favorite comic book character. So then I would freehand copy, you know, some of the posters that we would see in magazines and stuff like that. And just never stopped, essentially. 
Uh, yeah. I, I'd say that's probably the earliest start of my journey for sure. Nice. And you were talking about War of the Worlds. Um, was that like a movie soundtrack or was that like the book narrated or was it an album that I'm maybe not familiar with? So I'm not too, I think it started off as a audio album, I think. I'm not too sure. It, it was like, because I recall, uh, I don't know the exact decade, but basically there was this famous, um, you know, uh, what do you call it, broadcast, where basically mm. somebody was narrating the book and people were hearing it for the first time. Uh, right. But what was happening was, this is maybe like the 30s, 40s, somewhere around there, but basically people were turning on their car, tuning in halfway through the book, and they'd be like, is the world ending? Because they didn't know that it was a narration. They thought it was a news release. So yeah. that's the one thing that sticks with me with the original, um, you know, War of the Worlds uh, in terms of the book. But I, I could be wrong might... on all that. This is like history from when I was like high school or something. Yeah, I mean, I haven't listened to that record in years, but I'm pretty sure there wasn't any dialogue or anything. I think it must have just been the soundtrack, I guess. Yeah. But it was just, you know, you could tell when it was a different scene and you could tell when it was a different chapter. It was just so... Yeah, it just took you on this journey. And that obviously being accompanied by this incredible painted artwork was just absolutely mind blowing. Even to this day, I was in an, like a record shop not long ago and they had one of the copies in there and I hadn't seen it since I was a kid. And just all those memories, memories just came flooding back and just, and yeah. even it holds up even now, like the quality of that artwork and the painting is just so sick. It's really cool and dark. That's neat, man. I kind of have a similar memory. Um, yeah. There was this, book and it was supposed to it, you know it's primarily a non-fiction book about the planets and the galaxy and like all facts but then there was this end section that was all concept art for what aliens would look like on these different planets wow awesome and i think michael whalen might have done some of those illustrations but i remember just like skipping all the factual stuff and going immediately to the aliens and being like, oh, this is so cool. I got to pick up that book. It was pretty well published. Um, but I don't remember the, the name of it, but there also were illustrations of the mythological semblances of the uh, planets. So mm -hmm. like Mars, there was, you know, Mars, the God, and there was like this illustration of him, like all powerful. And there was like this cool uh, design symbol behind him. And like that book uh, just really sticks with me in terms of like how powerful those images were, kind of similar to what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. That sounds really cool. Yeah. So you're doing like some, and I think, you know, I see some of your work and I definitely still see the comic book influence, especially with like um, the strength of like shadow and light and black and white as being the core of it and then coloring on top of it. Um, what about when you were getting into like your teenage years and starting to take it a little more seriously? What did that journey look like? Yeah, so I mean, as you, as you know, I'm self-taught. So I mean, I didn't go to the best school. I, I grew up in a pretty kind of poor family. So you know, the school, the local school, was just really terrible. Like all the teachers were just checked out. Like it was all then substitute teachers, and I didn't. Again, just because of the the experiences I was having at home, I, w I was a bit socially awkward so i wasn't very confident and it kind of just had a, a sort of dominoes effect as it were so um even in school it was just looking at stuff that i really liked um and then i had like a like two or three friends that were you could tell they were it's in similar kind of music you know like metal and you know punk and stuff like that so then we would kind of you know mention bands to each other and then i'd go home and check them out and you know i'd find a Kerrang! magazine and check them out and then look at the album artwork because they, you, you know, it always display the album artwork with everything as well. Um, so, yeah, so it was essentially, again, just drawing stuff that I saw everywhere and, you know, getting more into the sort of heavier types of music. Um, my first CD was, I think it was Slipknot self-titled and I literally got it because the cover looks really sick. Yeah. Um, I think I, to be fair, I think I might have seen a video late at night on MTV2 or something. You probably had different music channels where you are, but it was like late at night. They would then show like the heavier sides of music, and yep. I would stay up oh, late. Oh, Headbangers head Ball. Yes, That's exactly. what it was over here. Yeah, that for for a bit at ours as well. Yeah. So, and again, just the, the, the way the visuals was just so tied into the music and the visceral side of the music as well. Um, so then I started. 
again, freehand copying a lot of stuff. So I'd get the, the CD cover of Slipknot. And again, they had really sick photography in, in the booklet and everything like that as well. So I would hand copy stuff like that in my little school textbooks with like a bio or a pencil or something like that. Um, and I just kept just kept doing doing that essentially, like freehand copying stuff, getting to the point where I could look at something, copy it, and the proportions would kind of just about work out. Obviously, at the beginning, it was terrible, and like arms and hands were out here and eyes out here and stuff like that. Yeah, but, um, yeah. I was just always just copying stuff. And essentially, like how you get painters now, they do sort of master works and studies, don't they? Of like, you know, the the pinnacle of classical art, just to get their head around how things work, like shadow and light, um, contrast, and all that sort of stuff. Um, so it's always just been very thematic in that sense. Just things that I like the look of, copying it, just figuring out what it is I like about it. Um, and it always was very stark lighting, very moody sort of lighting. Um, yeah, I'm probably rambling with each of these answers. No, no, I don't, make sense. I don't think so. Cool. So your primary method as being a self-taught illustrator um, was really copying and learning why something works and why it doesn't. Ultimately. Yeah, is that what cool. I'm hearing? in my teenage years. I mean, once I, you know, once I was drawing kind of clean-ish lines and stuff like that. I've always had a very analytical mind in a way where it's actually quite hard for me to switch off. I mean, even now, I don't think it's ever stopped where I'd be just out and about with my girlfriend and we'd be walking in the woods and I would look at a tree and it wouldn't be like it's just passing. I would be looking at it and analysing how the light's hitting it and just really zooming in on the details and kind of taking a photograph in my mind of how things yeah. work. And I think I've always had that analytical mind in looking at things and seeing how it works mechanically as well as you know how it actually just looks in terms of light and structure and form and everything like that it's interesting you say all this um if i can talk about my kind of progression in a way mm. i'm self-taught as well but my method almost from the get-go and up until probably like 2017 or so was purely drawing from imagination not copying anything no reference i didn't even understand the concept of that stuff right. then i started learning oh well if you want to learn how to draw like realistically and you want to try to draw stuff like this it is good to analyze all these things and learn these foundations and you know do studies and stuff so i've shifted my approach to be a lot more like what you're describing but for a long time Everything was, com I mean, of course, I'm being absorbed in with all these influences, mm. but it was all imaginations and coming from doodles and like stream of consciousness. That was like kind of always how I drew until I started being a little more deliberate. So That's I think it's kind of interesting. With your style, though, doesn't it? Because, I mean, your style is quite uh, abstract and surreal, you know, almost Dali-esque. So I think it lends itself to being very expressive and free and not having any sort of constraints as to, oh, it has to look like this or it has to be in the realm of reality, um, even in terms of color and composition. So I suppose it helps in a way, for sure. It, I, it, looking at your work, it looks like it, it almost has to be, um, it has to be free in that sense. Like you can't be confined to, to reference hugely, you know. Yeah. Now I'm trying to fuse the two, you know, the perks, right? Because if you can draw realistically and do that kind of stuff, but then also start from something that's more stream of consciousness, you get kind of the best of both worlds. At least that's what, you know, I'm aiming for. But this isn't about me, but I just think it's interesting how your approach was. My approach is similar to what you're doing now in that sense. But for a long time, I was completely not aware of what's really going on in the art world. I just like drawing. I was the kid in class who... You know, they'd be like, hey, we need somebody to draw this. And I'd be like, okay, sure. It's, it's interesting. Were you that kind of kid whenever the opportunity presented itself? Like there's a group project that involves some kind of drawing? Yeah, I mean, even though I was socially awkward, I was I definitely became the lackey in the schoolroom where, you know, if, I, if there was any sort of project and the kids like, oh, we need to draw like a logo for something. Yeah. You know, I'd be that quiet kid where they'd, you know, they explain to me what, what they wanted and I would draw it thinking, oh my God, they're gonna hate it. It's gonna be so terrible. And, you know, they were always like quite impressed with it. And then, you know, small little increments like that that kept happening kind of built my confidence a bit more. Um 
And I don't know why I think I just, you know, when you feel out of your depth when you're trying a different skill, I just always thought, you know, why, why am I feeling out of my depth? It's because I'm not understanding how to get from A to B, right? So I was just thinking if I can understand lighting and understanding how an arm bends and what it looks like from different angles, then later on in life, and, you know, testament to that, it has actually helped in a way where now I don't really have to look at a lot of reference. I mean, you know, with some things I will get stuck and I've got, you know, mood boards on, on Pinterest where, you know, if I'm stuck on a certain angle or something, I can kind of look at that briefly and then I'm kind of, I can then run with it from there. Um, so, yeah, I've kind of done a switcheroo as well where I've done that sort of legwork and I've built the foundational sort of knowledge and now I can be a bit more expressive and I can actually add more to a facial expression or a movement or something. Um, so, yeah, we all have different ways of learning for sure. And it just, I think it depends on your style and what, you know, what really attracts you to certain types of art, you know? Yeah. To that point though, too, one thing I've noticed with artists is, especially artists who are learning a lot and they're not quite, blossoming yet is they'll they'll be like um let's say they're faced with some feedback that's actually genuine and trying to be helpful and it's from maybe a friend right so not just someone online mm. and it's like you know maybe you should consider looking at how this hand actually is held and then immediately the uh defense mechanism is oh that's my style that's my style right. like every you know, using any kind of shortcoming as oh that's my style that's a very slippery slope to not you know, fall trap to, because I, I found myself, you know, in the past mentally doing that when it's like, really, it's just improve and, and take, uh, you know, study from reality to improve. Mm. And then your style isn't really a shortcoming then. So That's I don't right. know. Do you have like a take on that? Yeah, I mean, you've always got, a, you've, it's hard because it's such a balancing act, right? Because you do want to develop a style that's very distinctive, or at least, you know, you know, someone who wants to, some artists are fine with being very, not cookie cutter, but not having a defined style and kind of being a jack of all trades in the sense where they can be super versatile in terms of, you know, they'll do watercolors one week and the next week it'll be, you know, like cartoons and then comic art and then, you know, maybe super dark sort of metal type of art. But um, yeah, I think you've always got to be humble and you've always got to think, actually, I don't, I don't know everything. Like I might have a certain style, but and I think we all have that intrinsic sort of way of thinking of things where, you know, we don't look at some, well, I hope we don't all look at something and think, yeah, I've done it. This is really awesome. I've nothing to change here. I think we all look at stuff that we've done and we can analyze and self-deprecate in a sense where, well, you know, it, we've gotten to where we wanted to get at that particular point in time. But the next time we want to do it, we definitely want to take it a step further. And sometimes having outside perspective and someone saying, that's really cool, but maybe if the hand was turned this angle or, you know, maybe if a hand was a bit more like this instead of just like this, it adds more emotion, it adds more movement, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's just such a huge balancing act. Um, and I think it's just subjective to each person and, what again, what their style is. Yeah. No, I, I think that's really well said. In terms of creating a, a piece of really any type, is there a particular part of the process that you enjoy the most? Maybe you get the most creative flow or is the biggest escape? Yeah, it's tough because it, it actually changes with every piece. Um, and uh, I was enjoying Sawblade when he was explaining how <laughs> like the preliminary side of things is can, can be a bit tiresome or I can't remember what stage he was talking about, but so... With me, it's like coming up with the idea is really fun and I usually start off with a very rough sketch and, you know, it's like just very basic sort of shapes, you know, blobs and there's no definitive lines or anything like that. Um, I find that quite fun. And then the, the penciling side of things, then actually mapping it out for me to ink, I find is the most tedious because I'm so excited about getting to the inking stage <laughs> that I kind of, you know, I have to really take my time with the penciling stage. But then once I'm inking and I've got the lines down and I'm shading and doing my stippling and, and dots and hatching, that's that's the most enjoyable part for me because it just then feels that every stroke, it's 
becoming the final product you know every yeah. you know every part of the body that i'm shading it then it becomes more complete as i go and, it, and you can see it actually developing in front of your eyes that's definitely my favorite stage for sure yeah i could definitely relate there um do you, do you happen to drink coffee at all no <laughs> I, okay. I used to i've gone to decaf because um Man, you just—I can't, can't do straight lines when I'm, you know, like buzzing from a, a really strong coffee. <laughs> Ran into that problem this morning. That's why I asked. So I was like, because really? I, yeah. I, I was tasked with lines this morning uh, myself, right? And um, man, some really hard curves. And I, I, you know, I drank my morning coffee, and like Ooh. it was more challenge. I think they turned out fine. I mean, if you look real, real close, they're probably like a, a hair shaky. But that's—it's an endless pursuit, right? Trying to get a smooth line is like. You never fully, at least in my take, like I never am like fully satisfied. Um, but man, oh like God. I, uh, it definitely makes it harder. <laughs> man, it just, yeah. I mean, so I've gone, I used to be a bit of a drug addict. So I, you, I used to just really neglect art and this whole side of my life. And I've completely turned my life ar around now where, you know, I dedicate a lot of my time and I'm, I'm at a point now where I won't even go out during the week because I know I'll just be too tired. And, then I, you know, I won't be able to come out with something really elaborate, detailed and clean the next day. So, I've, you know, I mean, I drink, I still drink beers, but I, I kind of have a bit less of an unhealthy relationship. You know, I can, I can drink a few cans on the weekend and I'll still, you know, be up bright and early on the Monday and get some work done. But, yeah, coffee just makes me, it gives me the shakes and then, it doesn't matter like what music I put on. I'll then take a deep dive into different types of albums and bands. And then two hours have gone by and I've literally, I've not done anything. I've, you know, I've literally just been faffing around. <laughs> whatever the <laughs> term is for that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, I think I agree with what you're saying with like, you know, favorite parts and stuff. I think honestly, my favorite thing, right now probably is watercolor painting uh even okay. though i don't do it all the time but i just love that feeling of that first um layer with watercolor and i do like a lot of wet on wet stuff and i you know i i try to learn from a lot of like those watercolor masters that like metal people have no idea about but like there's guys like uh somebody i've really been inspired by this guy named andy evanson and he's just like a really great landscape watercolor painter and I don't know how they do watercolors. I mean, I've tried it. It's just so, it's just a different, it's a totally yeah. different world for sure. It's, it's a whole different approach, but it, it can help you really value soft edges. And mm. uh, so let's say one week, and, and you were talking about this earlier with like bouncing around too much. Well, maybe I'm guilty of that, but I also see the lessons in each medium. Mm. So if I go from inking one week where it's all about, in my, my case, trying to be tight yet expressive but then i go to watercolor and it's about color harmonies soft transitions you try to marry those two and then that's where you know without doing oils and all that stuff i attempt to do stuff that um aspires keyword aspires to be like frazetta where it's tight in some spots and then you know soft and has this really good sense of flow so mm, like awesome. i know he's one of your big inspirations i have this sketchbook here, and then I have this giant Tashin book. I don't know if you've seen that. It just came I out last year. This, man. Yeah, I've heard a lot about it. I've heard it's absolutely amazing. Yeah. A bit expensive, but yeah. yeah right, yeah. Totally but, worth it. And I've, I've seen um, one of the screenshots I took of your work, actually, was a watercolor you did of, uh, is it a canyon or something like that? Um, yeah. I think you did for a relative. And, yes, yeah, it's, it's really well done, man. And it's... Um, with me, even with my work, it's very precise and deliberate. But even now, as I get older and I guess just more experienced, I kind of realize you do need to balance that out with softer edges sometimes. It's like, you know, when you're, if you're a photographer and there's the bokeh effect where, you know, the, the background's sort of a bit blurred, it yeah. just it adds more power to the, the foreground and the subject matter as a whole. Um, so that's something. I've always really loved about watercolors. I mean, I would, I would never approach it myself because I would just be so out of my depth. And it's just, it's that free thing of just having so much water on, on, on the bristles and dropping it and just seeing it expand. Like that would just drive me insane. I'd be so- Don't do it on Bristol. I'll tell you right. that straight up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, man, if you want, if you, 
I would love to see you attempt because you're going to be way better than you think you are. Oh man, I don't know. It's just it's I all mean, about even... the surface. You got to mm. get the the arches like hot press or cold press paper. Right. Okay. You have to work on watercolor Is it paper. Like paper as well, like quite like porous. Oh yeah, it's cotton. It's 100. percent You want acid free, 100 percent cotton. And you'd be mm. amazed how much better it is than anything. Bristol, it's a nightmare. Uh, my friend Lucas Shawgoth Kinetics, um, would, are you familiar with his work? Uh, not by name. Not off you the got, top of you my got to look up his stuff, man. Um, mm. He's a, a friend of mine and also a, a big inspiration. But I think he has done watercolor on Bristol paper. And I'm like, how the hell do you do that? Wow. Because <laughs> it just slides all over the place. It's so man. smooth, right? Yeah, there's nothing yeah. for, there's nowhere for the paint to pull or to sink into. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's crazy. So. That's really cool, though. I, I like the fact that you are actually, because, I mean, like you said, going back to what I said about being a jack of all trades, like you can either, you know, just double and stick to one thing and then change the next week. But actually taking all the strengths from each of these mediums and and practices, you know, that's, that's just the best way to, to learn for sure. Like I, that's really admirable, I think. And almost going back to what you said about people who stick to one thing and they say, this is my style. Like you say, it can be a downfall because you're not, you're not really evolving in any way and progressing. You, you can kind of pigeon yourself, you pigeonhole yourself too much as well. Confine yourself, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I, and like, once again, I'm not comparing myself to these legends, but if I want to follow anything in their footsteps, People like Bernie Wrightson, Richard oh, Corbin, no. Frazetta even. Frazetta's mm -hmm. inks and he has paintings. Like They are versatile artists, yet you can look at their work and immediately know it's them. 100%. So why not learn different mediums and different approaches, but have enough of your own style uh, that you can find that balance? So, mm. uh, I mean, I don't want to go. I think a lot of it is just it's a, it, you have to check yourself. And it's like, do I feel like I'm too scattered right now? Um, like for instance, uh, this is a rough, so my, my clean copy is looking a lot better, but I'm working on this like really interesting cool. ink piece. And I was mm. thinking about doing airbrush and all this shit, but I'm like, man, I'm, I'm a beginner airbrush artist. Why don't I just do black and gray? And then the way I'm kind of changing it out, and everybody else, I'm talking too much about myself is I'm using Copic markers combined with ink. And it's kind of creating a cool level of depth within the piece. Yeah, I mean, actually, some of the stuff you see artists doing with um, those uh, Prismacolor like markers, yeah, and, and ink, it's kind of like the perfect merge between watercolor and like really graphic ink work. Mm -hmm. There's just the textures that it has and the way it kind of like pulls on the paper is just really, really awesome. Agreed. Well, let's talk about your process then. So it's hand drawn, hand inked. And then do you scan and then go to a computer for coloring? What's it look like? Yeah, so, I mean, again, it varies. So, I mean, uh, nowadays, actually, when it comes to a sketch, I've realized just being in, in, with my little tablet, you know, I'm, I'm drawing it all by hand. But in terms of maybe moving stuff around, it's just so much quicker for me to get the overall composition down. So nowadays it is like in Photoshop, just very rough scriggles with my tablet and then getting sort of the rough basis of a shape of like i mean obviously i do a lot of figure drawing right so it'll be like the pose of someone and i'll get sort of the basic outlines of their anatomy um and then you know depending on whether it's a commission you know whatever components they want i'll kind of roughly add those in and resize them and, and move them around so I, I like to have all my compositions have some sort of flow to them like i don't like to have too much just static face on views i mean i've started doing more of that lately but um yeah, so it's always that. And then from there, I'll basically just print that out and I've got a light box and then I'll go in with my pencil because then I can get really defined in terms of shading, You're getting more like the musculature down um, and obviously the, the line work itself. You know, if there's stuff like hair, I can really then get in with the, the different strands and the flow of the hair and, uh, you know, shadows and stuff like that. And then, so then... So that's basically the same process for everything I do. So if that's then an album cover, I will scan in those pencils and then I'll go straight into painting from there. Um, so then 
I will essentially, I, I always approach it from uh, what I am. I mean, I've never done traditional painting, not much anyway, but, you know, you can tell they have basically like a wash on a canvas and they'll have their pencils down. And obviously that wash will kind of set the, the overall tone. And then from there, they, they go in super dark and then build up the layers from there. Kind of um, actually, uh, Kieron from Spearhead, when I did that interview with him, um, noted that actually that's quite similar to what graffiti artists do. And I, I didn't realize that. Uh, and it makes sense, actually. So so that's the, the digital painting side of things. And then if I'm doing a personal piece, which is mainly ink, sometimes merch pieces, they, they like my ink style. It just depends. So it will go from obviously that stage of the pencils. I'll then put some Bristol board over top over the top of that on a light box, um, and then I'll start inking. Um, and then, yeah, then I'll scan that in and then do digital color essentially. Um, but with that type of work, I like my inks to do most of the legwork actually, kind of you know carrying most of the weight of the composition and the shadows and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then the digital color is essentially just adding highlights and just sort of overall, obviously, colors, you know, different hues and stuff like that. So that, that's my main process for everything that I do. I mean, you know, I do mainly ink work, but I mean, painting stuff, I've digital painting, I've probably only really been doing for four years, I think, solidly. Um, and I've, I just found that's been the best process for, for everything for me. Interesting. Yeah, and and then uh, using mostly Photoshop then for the digital program. Yeah, for the painting, yeah, it's always Photoshop. Yeah, um, obviously, like I don't, I used to do logo stuff, but not. I've kind of, I've quit doing logos just because I don't really enjoy it as much. So then, then obviously it would be vectorizing stuff in Illustrator, but it's it's mainly all Photoshop now. Yeah. Yeah. And then, what was I have two questions? So you're talking about anatomy. I guess it's kind of twofold on this. In your study of anatomy, did you memorize the names of all the muscles and was that helpful or do you just know off intuition from drawing stuff a million times? Just all purely by visuals, yeah, just by figuring out like the flow of like each muscles on the arms and stuff like that. And, you know, like all the um, action figures that you had as a kid, they were all like really muscly, you know, like He-Man and Spider-Man and stuff. You know, none of them were like my bills. They were all like super ripped and... You know, so that was another form of me then, you know, drawing stuff. Um, so, yeah, so purely visual. I mean, there's even like with the skeletal, skeletal sort of bones and stuff, there's like, how can you remember all of that stuff? It's just insane. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I haven't gone about doing it. I just, I know at like some atelier academies and stuff, they teach all the muscles because, or the bones, because it's like helpful just to remember to not forget that piece when you're mm. going in there but i mean it's I, I do it intuitively as well um i still need to use reference more often than you do because i think you should have a lot more figure drawing practice than me uh, mm. which is awesome but uh wh what piece of the figure or face do you find the most challenging like feet nose uh, lips you know what's kind of hard uh every time just a little bit to be honest i mean so again, just from having a very analytical way of looking at things, I drew hands and feet forever, like for for like a good year, even as a kid, I was just like, because it would just be so frustrating where I'd have a, a pretty decent sort of figure and like I'd get the muscles down. But then when it got to the hands and the feet, you know, you'd look at some of, I um, can't remember the guy's name, but yeah, that I really, really grinded and, and, you know, worked on that for a long time. But I still find that with hands and feet, depending on the character and the, the emotion you want to convey in the image, you can exaggerate it a bit. Um, you know, you can make them look more monstrous and you can make them look more decrepit or you can make them look a bit softer. So there's a lot of room. But I find with a face, I guess it just depends what expression I'm going for. But getting a really, I mean, with me, my neoclassical stuff, you know, getting a that quintessential neoclassical, serene but somber facial expression um it, there's just so much involved with it in terms of like how far wide the, the eyes are how big the eyes are how small and quite petite the lips are and yeah you know i just find that's actually the hardest and even now that takes me a lot of tries but again like you say it's just it's just practice you know i've, I've drawn so many figures now that a lot of it is pretty intuitive now but the face it it's different every time 
um, and there's different challenges to each sort of body shape. Like, you know, if it's, a, if it's, if you're drawing like a big monstrous monster, you know, you can't have a really slender gaunt face, you know, you've got to kind of take into account body fat and I'm probably far too analytical and, you know, technical about it in general, but yeah, that's, that's essentially the hardest, not the hardest, but I think what I put the most thought into is the face. Yeah. Do, do you find that the standard in which you hold your art, do you hold other artists or do you let a lot of artists off a lot easier and still love their stuff and you're way harder on yourself? 100% the latter. It's just like, I'm just far too, again, just going back to the analytical mind where I kind of, it's almost like an out of body thing where I, I look at it and I imagine if it is someone else, not I am anal analyzing it. But if it is someone else, I'm like, that's just fucking sick. Like, you've nailed it. You know, you're not going to go too in, in too deep. But um, right. I think we all do that for sure, I think. Yeah. Yeah, to varying degrees, I think. Uh, there, yeah. was, there was one time, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention it, but, like, you, uh, you had on Instagram, and you had this, in my opinion, a perfectly good drawing. <laughs> and you put an X and ink all over it. And I was like, what the hell? <laughs> and like, I get the struggle, but I literally, I, I wish I knew you better at that time. So I was like, dude, like, <laughs> like, top on a Zoom and have a beer because you, you don't need to beat yourself up like this, man. Man, I had so many people like, actually, yeah, like the comments yeah. on it were just hilarious. They were like, you're insane, bro. Like, yeah. And, you know, the artists that I really love, like, I think it was, like, Heavy Hand and stuff like that. They're like, you're fucking crazy, dude. I think even, yeah. like, God Machine. Like, I love God Machine. He's always commenting on my stuff. But, um, yeah, we. I just hold myself to a ridiculous, stupid standard, and I think a lot of us do it. It's just that piece, it wasn't necessarily, like, the whole thing was bad. It was just the balance. Like, the, in terms of, like, the dot shading, it just wasn't – Again, this just sounds like I'm just such a, an anal retentive dude, but like the spacing in between each of the dots was annoying me compared to like how thick the line weight was. Hey, I get it. You know, the you could also just re ink it. You got the base drawing still. So it's not like you, you didn't just scrap the entire thing, you just scrapped that draft of it. Right? Yeah, that's right. I had the yeah. pencil like still, so then I basically just started again, you know, with with the pencils underneath a, a fresh set of uh, a fresh sheet, sorry, of Bristol board. So yeah, I kept the, the, the main bones of it. It was just the, it was essentially just the shading and the, just the finer details uh, that were just bugging me. And, you know, I'm sure we've all had it where we're just, a piece isn't going right and we just keep pushing it and pushing it. And we, th we think, oh, I've spent so much time on this. The client needs it. But I've, this has come as I've, as I've kind of um, come, this, this has come with age, I think, a bit more and a bit more experience where it doesn't matter what the deadline is. If I'm not happy with it, I'm not just going to push it out and be like, okay, cool, that's done. If I need to restart something, I will restart it and I will just do a late night if I have to. I won't just be like, this is fine because they've had a set budget. Like, I really put a lot of onus on my drawing and what I'm giving to a client. So, that was essentially why I was just, I can't give this out to this person and, and look at it and think this is terrible. I just couldn't do it. I get it, man. So what are your, you know, kind of like illustration working hours look like? Are you bouncing another job or is this your, your full time right now? I'm full time now. Uh, and I have been for how many years, man? Um, I think, Three to four years now I've been full-time. Uh, before that, I've worked every job under the sun. I was a forklift driver. I was a bin man, like, taking out the trash. Um, I was, uh, yeah, working in, like, cheese factories and everything. So I was, I was doing that for, like, you know, 40 hours a week, coming home in the evening, working on a commission or, or just drawing something, you know, just trying to kind of build up my own style. And then working on the weekends, uh, building that up. And I kind of just got to that tipping point. Um, and, yeah, so I've been full-time for four years. And my hours, I'm, I'm quite an early bird. I actually really like getting up, like, early. I take my dog for a walk and then try to finish around, you know, five, six o'clock. You know, some days I'll start at nine and finish maybe at, like, seven or something like that. But generally speaking, I, I like to treat it as 
a nine to five, not in a corporate, you know, like requirement sense, but just in terms of hours where I know I can then get rested yeah. enough for the next day. That's really good, man. It takes a lot of discipline. So was there like a moment of a leap of faith to do it full time or was it more like a subtle train? Yes. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, I think I'm quite pragmatic. So I was, you know, I was, I was just super tired, like trying to build my name up and, um, another thing me and my partner wanted to do is we wanted to buy a house right but you know we economically speaking you know we don't make loads of money and you know even the jobs i was doing it was like minimum wage it was just you know not the best sort of hours so you know we've not got any inheritance coming we don't have any well-to-do parents so we would have to just build everything ourselves in that sense so we actually decided to move into a caravan and live on a field for a few years and we did exactly that so all our overheads were just totally like really scaled down where it was manageable so that I could build my business, but also so that we could save up, you know, for a deposit on a home. Um, and so with that, I think it allowed me to just really risk everything and just jump in with both feet. I don't think I would, I would just be exhausted if I carried on trying to do it while trying to keep an, you know, eight hour a day job. I just don't think I would ever get to the point where, I would feel I could just jump in with both feet. You know, I think I did have to just quit that really scale down all my overheads and everything and just think this is it now, you know, I am going to be a full-time artist. And even though it will take maybe a few months to a year for me to get to the point where I'm earning enough to survive and pay the bills, the fact that it, it, we were just in a van on a field just allowed me that room, you know, so that was, yeah, definitely a lot of risk and just jumping in for sure. That's awesome to hear, man. And things happened after that where <laughs> we got kicked off that land by um, the landlord and we then had to spend all our savings on then basically deposits and thing. Anyway, so we're back to square one on getting a house, but <laughs> my business is built up at least. So I'm still still full time and able to rent a house, which is nice. But yeah, it's taken a lot of discipline, like you say, you know, really just making sure I'm healthy enough and rested enough to do what I need to do and just grinding hard, man. Like there is no lazy days. There is no like, Oh, I'll get to this later. It's just like grind, 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 you know? That's so cool. Uh, look at my thing here. You don't, I, I don't have any follow up questions there. I mean, just from my perspective. So I'm currently doing what you, you used to do, right? So I have a full-time job and I'm doing all the drawing in the evenings and then during the weekends. And yeah, it's, it's tricky because I feel like I'm not getting enough work done to, um, you know, develop a really solid portfolio, but mm. I'm also not at that point of taking the leap either. So it's, it's interesting in all these interviews that I've, I've had where even these really big artists that, um, you know, we hold up here, some of them still are doing a full-time job because it affords them, in America, at least, you know, health insurance, some stability. Right. So it's, I feel like it's, it's always been hard to be a full-time artist, but um, it, 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 every decade and every year has its own challenges, but uh, making yeah, that decision sure. is, is very difficult. hundred percent dude. And you know, at the moment, you know, the economy isn't great, you know, like things are just so much more expensive. Yeah. So that's going to have a knock on effect on any industry, really. But, you know, when you're then trying to build up your own business and you've still got, you know, sky high rents to pay and stuff, it's just it's really tough. And, yeah, I was blown away when I heard that Riddick was still just doing a day job. But I think, you know, I think that comes to him just still wanting that freedom as well, like you say, where he can pick and choose projects. Um, and also then he's not struggling and he's not worrying about stuff at the end of the month. You know, I, I do sometimes miss that. But. Again, I think I, you know, I got to the point where, yes, it was a risk, but I knew that I had, say, you know, one project a week at least to, to work and get paid for, you know. So, but you know, if I was still renting uh, like an apartment at that point, I, I would be a lot further down the line. I probably would only just now be doing it full time, you know. So, it just depends on your situation and how how much you can risk, you know. Yeah. When you 
were in that still working and then doing some commissions, did you have to turn people away? Like were there growing pains? And then you basically had a, a bit of a well that you had to fill up. So when you did end up going full time, was it a bit dry at first? But then you were, when you were working, you almost had too many projects, but not enough. Like it's that, it's that give and take. Am I kind of articulating that right? Yeah, I, I see what you mean. Yeah, so I was just spreading myself far too thin. I mean, I was quite lucky that people sought me out um, just through friends of friends. And, you know, it started off with smaller sort of hardcore bands and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, budgets aren't great just for the fact, by virtue of everything being quite DIY. Um, so I, I at the beginning, I was just spreading myself far too thin. Like things were like always coming in, but I was like, man, I wasn't necessarily turning people away, but I probably should have because then I wouldn't have been so burnt out. Yeah. Um, so then once it got to the point where I was just full time, it, it wasn't dry. It was pretty steady, but it, it was, I think the growing pains I had was just not having that that backup of, I was fine, I'm getting a paycheck from this job at the end of the month. So if it's a quiet week or a quiet three weeks out of the month, I, I'll still be fine. You know, that that was the biggest adjustment for me was just the stress levels um, of just dealing with that and thinking, it's just me now. You know, I've got to be, it's all down to me. There's no, <laughs> there's no saving me if something fucks up, you know? Yeah. Uh, very, I was very fortunate to be very busy. Um, just, I think because I, yeah, I was very pragmatic about stuff, um, and I just put the work in. Man, I was just, I was super tired, but I just, the end goal was just, you know, my passion and doing that for a living was just, it just was so. It's something that I had to try, and I was exhausted. And I'm sure you get times when you're exhausted when you're still trying to work on something, and and you've still got to be of sound mind when you go into your day job right you can't just coast yeah. through that and just clock in clock out you still so you're basically spending you know like a hundred hours a week sometimes being on the ball and you know trying to be cognizant of what's going around you and tasks that you have to do it's just insane it's, it's tricky for sure yeah so was there a breakthrough band for you or a breakthrough moment in the sense of you know getting in a lot of more of these like uh technical death metal death core type projects because it seems like that's largely a lot of your work in the last several years you know art spire unique leader records um stuff kind of like that was anything like that um yeah so like i say it was at, the, at first it was kind of smaller hardcore bands and punk bands and stuff like that and then i think the first sort of the band that approached me and they had like a really good budget and it felt like legit was bound in fear. Um, okay. So, cause I've done th uh, three album covers for those dudes. Mm -hmm. Love them all. Really, really lovely guys and from UK as well. Um, so that was the first band where it's like really good budget. When I sent them like my invoice and like whole process thing, it wasn't like, Oh, can I, uh, this can I you know pay you in a few weeks? It was like yeah, cool. Here's a deposit. Here's you know everything just seemed really at a professional level, so that was awesome. Um, and that was obviously through Unique Leader Records. Um, I then found out later that uh, CEO of uh, Unique Leader, Jamie Graham, I think at, even at that point he was already sort of eyeing me up and sort of recommending me to people, which was awesome. So yeah, that was the first sort of breakout band in the sense of. This is more than just some, you know, local band. You know, this is like that. You know, they're touring. Uh, they've got a good following and stuff. They're on a label. So that that was the first sort of breakout moment for me. That and that was a really awesome project as well. Nice. And then you've just been consistently working on projects related to that um, and unique leader for at least the last three or four years, right? Yeah, it was just word of mouth, um, which was awesome. Like, uh, obviously, after that band, you know, other, other sort of dudes saw it and then wanted that similar sort of style. And it was cool because it was, you know, it was dark. It wasn't like I was having to step out of my comfort zone or anything. Not not that that's bad. I mean, I, you know, it's good to step out of your comfort zone, but I think it, I, I could be me as an artist. You know, it was dark yeah. and it was visceral. Whereas when I was doing stuff for hardcore bands, it was so varied. It was like, oh, can you do a logo this week? You know, the next week it would be, you know, a T-shirt. But even the subject matter, it would be a bit sort of all over the place. Um, so, yeah, it was from there. It was just word of mouth. More, more stuff through Unique Leader. 
Um, and yeah, I've just been super lucky. Like, I don't really feel I've mastered social media to any extent, but it was just through that, you know, people just seeing my stuff um, and it just exploding from there. Like, like the snowball effect, you know, not necessarily exploding because that almost um, makes it seem like it was really quick and, and sudden. It was very, it was slow, but steady, you know? Yeah. No, I, I could definitely tell it like picked up, but I know what you mean. It's not mm. like you've made it. You're still... Wanting to keep climbing. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, there wasn't this, you know, viral moment or anything like that. But no. In terms of like the the metal metal scene and stuff, um at least over here in the States and stuff and online too, I just noticed that there's a lot of like divide between, you know, people who like deathcore and like technical death metal, and then some people like, you know, just the old school death metal or even the new wave old school death metal, like I'm just kind of surprised how many people like really are so stuck in those camps. They either listen to one or the other. Like, do you kind of have a take on that? Yeah, it's, it's so common dude. And it's like, even though a lot of the commissions I get are tech death and death core, like, you know, that's not necessarily even my favorite genre. Really. I listen to lots of different stuff. I mean, I started off like a hardcore kid. It was like, you know, misfits, crow mags, stuff like that. Um, and then like, you know, sort of the more grittier, almost crusty, sort of full of hell um, bands like that. Doom, Primitive Man, um, Portrayal of Guilt, and just like a whole myriad of different sort of bands. And obviously Tech Death as well. I just love the the technical proficiency of it. Um, I dabble in music myself as well. It's very sort of like, it's not, not really worth chatting about or anything, but I've always played guitar and I just, I've always loved all different types of guitar driven music and heavy music and it, yeah it frustrates me how elitist people can be um and even now like it's 2023 and people are just saying oh this band is not this and you know getting into semantics and stuff like that and it's just exhausting it just means nothing you know like if you like something just support that band and support that you know why why should you care what genre it is or how you know, obscure it is or anything like that. You know, I just like good music, dude. Like, it's it's frustrating. And I think a lot of us who who have at least a few brain cells feel the, a similar way. You know, we, we look at the music that we love and we think, you know, you couldn't have this band play with this band live, but I still love them both equally. You know, so why, why pigeonhole yourself? It just, yeah, it pisses me off sometimes. Yeah. I, I think a lot of it is just like... I, I feel the need and I don't because I'm obviously this is a public podcast, but like I, I feel the urge to like not tell people that like, you know, when I was in high school, that was the death war explosion. So obviously I was listening to that stuff. Mm, right. you know? So it's like, why should I have any shame in saying what was just a historical moment? Um, so I, I, a lot of it is, you know, I just personally don't like the BS, but I feel like in the last couple of years, um, one place that I've noticed it is there's a, you know, Chris Garza of Suicide Silence. He has the Garza podcast. Mm. He brings deathcore and death metal bands on. And what you realize is like the bands all get along just fine. You know, maybe they're not like favorites, like, you know, artists of each other, but like they're all just in the industry seeing the same things. Mm. So I, I see, you know, visual art is not that different, right? Like I've talked to guys who are only working on underground death metal stuff. It's like, mm. sweet, that's more your brand. And then currently your brand has a little more of the death porn tech death to it. But like at the end of the day, you're doing the same job and like seeing the same yeah. stuff. So that's why right. I just find some of those things so stupid and divided. And it's not by choice, you know, I don't, you know, yeah. if I, a band messages me and, and they're like, sorry, we're not deathcore. I'm like, I'm sorry. I only listen to deathcore. <laughs> like, move on. You know, it's just yeah. like, is the concept really cool? You know, have I got some creative freedom? Is it, you know, is it going to be fun? And are the guys, you know, do they know what they want? And is it going to be a cool relationship? You know, that's what it's all about for me. It's not, it's not about what the band is or, you know, I mean, I will, like I say, when you're starting out, obviously you're working with bands who are in different degrees of success or you know like diy or labels or whatever so you know some bands will have better budgets than others and that's not necessarily what it's all about but you know i have got bills to pay you know if, if right. a band messaged me and they say look I, we've only got this much but we want this really elaborate piece 
usually I say, look, looking at, at your budget and the concept, it's cool, but maybe we can scale it down a bit so that we can still work together. But, you know, you do get bands who, you know, they may have this amazing idea, but they just don't have the budget. And as well, on the flip side, you have bands that, you know, have an amazing budget, but they don't know what they want. So then it takes like a long time to figure it out. And then you've then got a charge for that time as well, you know, because it's like you're spending so much bandwidth on something. But um, yeah, I don't care who works with me or who it's just, yeah, it's just silly. And I mean, that point you made about how the bands themselves, they all get on quite fine. It's just the fans themselves. It, it is so true. It's the fans that get, you know, worked up about semantics and sub genres and stuff like that. Like, you know, when you meet these bands and stuff, we're all just people. We're all just, we all have different tastes. And I mean, some of the heaviest bands that you listen to, you, you know, you, you hear stories about how, like, you know, the singer of the Dillinger Escape Plan loves slow jams, like he loves boys to men and stuff like that. You know, yeah. you, you look at Archspire, the vocalist like loves Tech Nine and hip hop. That's why he's got that super fast machine gun rap over this, the, the most ridiculously heavy music and fast music you will ever hear. Like, it's it's only the fans that pigeonhole themselves, you know, because that's you're basically chastising your creativity in that sense and your growth. So it just it's stupid. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think we both could agree, too. If you like what you like and you don't like what you don't like, that's fine, too. Absolutely fine, it's just, yeah. it's just like, why further the divide and make people mm. feel guilty for what they like? That's my yeah. broadest point. I'm not saying yeah. everybody has to like Deathcore, because if, if you find it too highly produced and you don't like that sound, I, I'm not going to try to sell you on the fact that it's worth merit. But mm. uh, I do find that all the interviews I watch – um, especially, like I say, like I'm trying to like guards the podcast. I mean, I, it's a very good weekly podcast, man. They've had Devourment, they had uh, Signs of the Swarm on recently, and um, you know, I mean, I like Devourment a lot, but like Signs of the Swarm guys are hilarious, you know, and like it's yeah, just, right, it's just yeah. good, good humor. It's like hanging yeah. out. So um, I think learning more about the people behind the bands and the artists behind the artists, it's. Uh, I think it's something that's going to help it be sustainable in the long term because then you're more emotionally invested to support these people because, mm. and I don't want to get too dramatic about it, but like AI art does not have a face. So the best thing we can do as artists, in my opinion, is not only get really good at our craft and develop a unique style, but put ourselves out there in terms of our actual face because it's hard to ignore that. Then. 100%. Yeah, that's a very good point, actually. Um, it's very easy to hide behind your art and hide behind your music. But I think, you know, so much of it is part of your personality. And it's, uh, you can't, I don't think you can create catharsis by creating something that's made purely by formula. You know, you have to have some sort of struggle and emotion and tension and release in music for it to, to actually really make an impact, you know? It's a very good um, caption from Simon Pegg. I don't know if you know, he's a British actor. He did Shaun of the Dead. Um, oh, yeah. All of that sort of stuff. So uh, I think he was like being interviewed on TV and they were asking him about, you know, the writers uh, protest in Hollywood. Um, and he was like, yeah, I totally get it. And he was saying how, um, you know, AI, it doesn't have struggle. It, it, you know, it didn't have his girlfriend break up with him and then create, you know, this masterpiece of writing because there was real innate struggle and emotion and trauma involved, you know, in this, in this, in this work. And even with my work, you know, like I've not, I've not touched on it a lot, but it does come from trauma that I've experienced. Now that's why I draw dark stuff. It's not because I romanticize the idea of demons and blood and gore. It's, um, it's coming from a, coming from a vulnerable, visceral place, you know? And I th I hope that's why it can, that's why people might be compelled by my work or at least stop and look at it for more than a couple of seconds, you know? If it's made, I mean, I don't want to go too deep into AI because I think we could go on for hours and it just, I don't have time for it, you know? People, I, I won't have a go at people for using it if they just want to use it for a wallpaper or whatever, but... You know, that it's just, it, it, it's, again, it's another very divisive topic. You know, people see it as this really, um, 
like pure thing it's like oh it's like consciousness but you know in in technology and you know we should we should you know, you know mother it and there's other sides to it where again i don't want to go too deep into it but when you look at data com- companies and the, the way they harvest our data and our like our complete identities already with facebook and instagram and how we're becoming slaves to algorithms like you know how it's not outlandish to think that there there is a nefarious um agenda behind it you know it's not just this pure thing of like we love art let's get more art out there i think it's commodifying art i think it's you know monopolizing art in a way where only big tech companies are going to profit from it you know yeah i mean 100 percent. and and whether you like it or not or you support it or you don't i still find it as competition so mm. i have to do what i can to uh, compete and the way to be compute is to be more human and actually like, yeah, like I said, put, put your face out there, not mm. as much as your art. Cause that's ultimately what matters. Right. Um, so if, if, if my craft was complete shit, you know, that really wouldn't have any merit, but trying to do both, I think is that's how I personally am going to compete with it. And I'm a very competitive person. I'm a, I'm a friendly person, but, uh, you know, I was raised in a, a sports family, so being competitive oh, okay. was one of the earliest instincts for me. So right, okay. um, I'm like a competitive type artist person, you know, like that's why um, I've been very inspired recently by, you know, Todd McFarlane, because mm. he came from baseball. He came from being a competitive, more jock type guy. I'm not saying I was ever a jock, but... I get the merit of taking some of those aspects that uh, really shape you, the discipline of sports, the performance, mm-hmm. the always trying to up your ante, and then you just apply it to your craft. So uh, I find um, people like that that aren't like the typical, you know, hipster kind of snobby artist people. I find those others like Todd McFarland very inspirational. Hundred percent, yeah. And competition is healthy. You know, it's good. It, it you know, it creates this. Um, I find competition and inspiration can be quite intertwined. You know, you look at something, and you look at an artist that you like or that you want to be like, and you look at that stuff and you think, "Fuck! Like, how the fuck did they do this? Like, I want to get to that point." So that's almost like being inspired. But then. I definitely get it where I'm thinking, do you know what? I'm next time I do a piece, I'm going to try and put as much as I can into it just so I can get closer to that sort of level. You know, it never, it never ends. Competition is good. It, it demands, it demands good results, you know? Yeah. It's, it's what keeps you on that consistent schedule, right? Cause you got something yeah. always to prove. Mm, exactly. Yeah. Um, let's go ahead and shift and, and, Pull some artwork up, but if we, if I may, let's do the um, artists that you picked out to kind of highlight. So uh, yeah. basically, a couple of days ago, I hit up Shindy and I was like, "Hey, um, something I think would be cool to do in the segments going forward is, you know, not only just talking about your own art, but art that inspires you and why you like it." So we have about, I think, five images. I'm gonna pull those up here, and I need to backtrack a little bit. But we have Aaron Horkey, who's a contemporary illustrator. He's up first. Um, and then we have Frank Rosetta, who is an inspiration to pretty much all of us, which is cool because everyone has a different take on why they like his work. But just sure. starting out, uh, tell me a little bit about, you know, why this piece moves you. I mean, to be honest, it was quite hard finding just decent resolution images of Aaron Hawkey's work. There's a lot of like photos and photography of his work. Um, yeah. But um, and also, before we start, I just want to say it was really tough, even just thinking of two. Like, I'm inspired by so many different artists. I mean, you mentioned uh, Bernie Wrightson. He's a I'm a huge fan of his painting and his inking. Uh, Simon Bisley. Oh, yeah. Glenn. Glenn Fabry, I don't know if you hear him, he's a UK artist. He did a lot of um, the Preacher cover artwork. I'm not familiar with him. Oh, he's amazing. You should check him out. Um, and obviously, like Hawker, uh, Hawkey, sorry. Fraser Irving is another one. I've literally made a list because I didn't want to forget like the amount of artists that I love. Mm-hmm. But um, they're more sort of obviously contemporary, like, you know, current types of artists. I could go on for ages about classical artists. But um, 
Yeah, Aaron Hawkey, this piece is uh, it's just the flow of it all, like the leaves and just, you know, I could just stare at his work for hours on end. Like he's, in terms of an inking artist and graphic artist, he is just perfect in my opinion. Yeah. Like his, his balance of light and shadows. I mean, he knows when to just really just do fill out blacks. I mean, if you look at the foot and the grass and you know, all the blades of grass and everything, and it just all has that dynamic flow to it and power and just... Yeah, everything's like, moving in the same direction. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. And it's just dynamic as well. It's not like, you know, you've got these leaves that jutter out and kind of break it up a bit to make it more dynamic. Um, but he's just understanding of just shadow and nature and how nature actually flows in a chaotic but, you know, flowful way. It's just... He just baffles me. He's just one of my definitely biggest inspiration in, in inspirations in terms of contemporary current um, graphic artists. Hundred percent, man. He uh, so the band Wayfarer they just announced a new album, and he did the album artwork for it. And it's purely lettering and typography. Mm. His typography is oh, next man. level, dude. Because that's the kind of stuff that I I can't do at all. And mm. I'm just I mean I'm blown by all his work. But I, it's like I could, it's easier for me to fathom doing something like this than doing anything with letter forms. Yeah, uh, sure. But he's he's just remarkable, man, and uh, he's got such a good hand for for hatching and texture, like mm. those. It really uh, creatively formed cloud shapes in the back, like all yeah. those very small um, hatching strokes. Really adds a nice texture, and and then you even see some expressiveness, in, right? Like if you look on that left side, look at that little. Um, you know, kind of maroon stroke right there. Right, that's exactly. Right in the sky, like like mm. that's a nice, delicate touch. That kind of um, it keeps it from being too stiff. Which that's what's amazing is oftentimes there's a balance between something being too detailed and then it can be stiff. He never sure. runs into that problem. Yeah. Again, it goes back to what I said before about, you know, having a, a background which doesn't distract, you know, it actually brings more power to the foreground and the, the actual, the centerpiece of the artwork, as it were. Um, just the atmosphere he has in his pieces. I mean, you know, like the, all the, the, the amount of space the cloud in the background actually takes up is almost half of this image, right? But yeah. the other half is just so detailed and stark. It just, it's just so powerful. And yeah, his lettering, especially, I mean, I've always, I mean, I kind of started off doing a bit more graphic design work as well. And I, I, I used to actually really like doing logos until it became very sort of deathcore bands where it was all just really spiky and like no one wanted anything like cursive or ornate. Right. I've always loved drawing a filigree and, you know, doing ornate text work. So that's another big, a big reason why Hawkey is just, my dream artist for, for me in terms of inspiration he just he just ticks all the boxes for me which is absolutely insane and beautiful have you heard of the artist i, I recently got put on to her i, I believe it's a, a female but um i think her instagram is saprophile have you heard her name at all i've not heard the name but i think I'm, you would love it man if you showed me the work i might recognize it there's just obviously so many people you follow on instagram sometimes it's hard to keep track um she's I'll she's kind of coming out more now i mean i'm sure she's been drawing for a long time but she did mm -hmm. uh let me see if i can find it real quick uh i got all my metal yeah, covers cool. here uh speed h's but she did the newest hammers of misfortune cover what was the uh what was her instagram handled again I believe it's saprophile here let me uh blow myself up real quick but you see that and all that texture so she did oh, pen and ink and then uh i believe digitally colored but man there's so much detail and it kind of reminds me of a uh, final fantasy 10 sin in terms of, like the concept yeah that's crazy dude that's really sick and it actually reminds me of some of hawkey stuff as well exactly that's why i see a little bit of similarity a lot in the uh the hatching techniques and uh, subtlety but um, definitely, definitely check out her work. I want to have her on the show. I want to have Aaron on the show. I haven't reached out to either of them, but uh, if for some reason they're hearing it, uh, I'd love to have both of you guys on. Yeah, really sick. Really sick. Then we got two more here. Um, 
one of the things with the presentation mode is unless you really, you know, if you're on a desktop, you can see these things better, but please check out the artwork on their website or Instagram. But you know, the level of detail is kind of hard to capture in this setting. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me about these two here. Um, so again, it's just that balance of really stark, but really open in a really weird way. I mean, in, in a way you wouldn't think it, you know, and I think a lot of that, I mean, with the first image on the left, I'm not sure of the names of all of these pieces. It's hard to keep track. But, um, I think he must lighten it. I, I guess he must then scan it in and lasso it out and then actually lighten the actual hue of the ink to, to kind of create that separation or it's just really thin, but um, and just the detail, man, just the sheer amount of detail, but you can see every single blade of grass. You can see where everything starts and ends. It's not like this, it's chaotic, but it's just so precise and deliberate. It's just, it just boggles my mind every time. Um, and again, in terms of inking, just super ins inspirational for me. Like I want, I want every line to similarly have just it's everything flows together. You know, it's not like I'm sure it is random when you really zoom in, but if you look at just the corners of the head of this owl creature here and the way it all fans out to the side of the head, and you know, with the wings and everything, everything just has flow. He always has these really long sort of tails of mm -hmm. like even if it's like string or something like that like really impossibly long smooth lines just as a massive flex of how much of a <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's just oh so man cool. um, and the snake piece i mean where do you begin man it's just so again detailed but stark and so, the contrast is just perfect you can see everything i'm pretty sure it's probably only maybe three colors max if it was a screen um, you obviously see the white highlights in the bottle uh, and the string and the cork, but man, just the sheer amount of detail is just, and his, his understanding of texture as well is just insane. And form, man. That's the thing. Yeah. You, a lot of yeah. people have texture, but the sense that he can have the form and the three dimensional, you know, shading and lighting uh, on it That's is insane. incredible. Like the, the sharpness of that spine of the snake. Mm. Like, man, it's just, it's such a strong element. Because if it was just round, which my my temptation, if I was drawing, would be just a round snake. But the fact that he has a little bit of that edge, man, it just adds right. so much. And on the left there, you know, everything's stylized, yet has, you know, those foundations and realism. I love the slanted horizon line. Um mm just it, it creates a element of chaos and beauty the negative sp uh, space within the piece so it's easy to read like you were talking about the form of the clouds mm. and the fact that you know he's not just a wooden trick pony he drew clouds this way and this one and completely different in this way you know it's, <laughs> right, yeah it's he has a whole world of shape language that's unique to his so, yeah and it always lends cool. itself to the piece you know it's just he, he'll adapt different types of shapes to the piece to add more power to it you know um yeah. just you know that it, just the owl's face the way it's just all negative space it's just so creepy mm -hmm. and beautiful at the same time like it just really has this just this perfect balance of open space which gives more power to that detail and the hatching that he does it's just absolutely baffling yeah unreal Let's shift to uh, Frazetta. The godfather of fantasy art, right? I mean, yeah, everyone knows this dude. It's like, how could you not? And again, just, you know, some of the, the books and covers and stuff that my dad had, you would see paintings like this. And I think um, I even saw a book on, uh, is it Boris Vall Vallejo or Vall Vallejo? Vallejo, yeah. Um, even his stuff as well, just really like, Beautifully painted bodies, like the anatomy and oh, almost photorealistic at points. But what I love about Frazetta is, again, it's it's really expressive and it all has so so much flow to it. Um, he knows when to just really fill things out really deeply. And then, I mean, on the left piece, I mean, m maybe not everyone can see it, but you've got these like really kind of ghoulish characters in the background, kind of in the mist. 
Like you've got yeah. this sort of weird bird character and this weird sort of sloth and just a hand and a wing and it's just just so just insane. Like the attention to space and atmosphere. And then contrasting that with just a really deeply dark, stark figure in the foreground with this strength really, of that pose, man. Yeah, man. Like the, the back muscles and everything and the, the, the spine and the way it, it flows out into the foreground with the tail and the water. And, oh, it's just so insane, man. And, and obviously his quintessential sort of cat-faced voluptuous ladies. But again, the lighting. <laughs> yeah. Just so beautiful, man. The flow and everything is just perfect man his color his sense of color and just atmosphere is just insane and he, he lets the values do the work you know like i mean mm. he definitely has a great eye for color but to me everything is all about the values and just such confident decisions man i mean mm. every frisetta peak piece has it just oozes confidence like, i don't know you know it's it's hard to really define that, but I find in terms of most confident artists, in my opinion, I think Frazetta and Wrightson, every stroke completely deliberate, like just, I mean, I, I'll like try doing studies of, of Wrightson, man. And every time I do them, like they're, they're decent. Uh, people who are maybe not artists, they'd be like, Oh, this, that's pretty much identical. But I know the strength of the strokes that Wrightson has versus what I'm doing. And it's yeah. like a whole nother level, which is good to aspire to. But man, I just, I just see it, you know. Hundred percent, man. Yeah. And again, like when I was, you know, when I was younger, and I was copying these sort of like these, you know, masterworks. Like, well, they are masterworks. But um, yeah, like you can't replicate that confidence. You know, you do a line, a hatch, and you can tell when you've literally you've pushed all the way through, as opposed to having a base point and actually just flicking off with confidence. You know. Yep like having that sort of tail end to, to a hatching line or something like that. Um, and yeah, like it's really, when you look at Frazetta's compositions, they're actually really simple, right? It's two characters and a background, but just the, the dynamic that he can include in it is just, I mean, look, look at the right hand piece. It's just, you know, this woman and a panther and a background, but just the way he's pulled in the foreground with this weird vine branch and, the way he's got mist behind the panther, just so that the, the, the black panther has just got so much more power to it, you know? Um, that's something I think I still need to get better at is atmosphere in my work and, you know, not making everything... Again, I'm just being really self-analytical, but yeah, that space, you know? Like, giving space to the foreground, middle ground, and background is just... You know, I don't need to fill in everything, every little, you know, square inch of a piece. I'm getting, for sure, I'm getting, I'm actively thinking about it more now. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I could just, I could just stare at Frazetta's work for hours. When we get to know. your, when we get to your section and show your artwork, I, there's a specific way that I can tell that you add that depth and I'll, I'll highlight it. But I know what you mean, simplifying. Okay. Mm. Like, like that that's really what you're honing in on but um i think you 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 definitely have a good way of doing it but as far as it could be improved i'm if you see it i'm sure i'll see it when you accomplish it thanks dude and then these these are uh you know two more pieces i think we've got the fire and ice poster on the right if i'm not mistaken and then right, i yeah. i don't recall the the name of the one on the left the if you ever do end up buying the uh, Tashin book, it, I, as far as I know, it includes all the pieces Frazetta ever did, minus maybe, I don't know, 50. Uh, but even then, I don't know. I mean, it's a gigantic book. It definitely has all these covers. And it's it's almost too big, frankly. It's good for each image. But to actually like look through it, it's, it's kind of difficult. <laughs> right, yeah. I could have, um, I also wanted to say, like, I could have obviously have picked, um, uh, what's it, uh, Death Dealer. Yeah. Um, and obviously all the really quintessential ones. But I know everyone knows Frazetta, everyone's seen his work, right? I kind of wanted to pick out some of the more, obviously, I think Fire and Ice is a very known piece, but there's a lot more of his lesser known ones that I've just, I've not gawked at for as long. So they've, they're just still so fresh in my mind, whereas... 
you know, like Death uh, Dealer and um, some of the other pieces, like the Viking and the the snow, the polar bears in the snow. Yeah, yeah. Um, like they're all very striking pieces. But yeah, I kind of wanted to hone in on some of the lesser known pieces because they're just. Uh, there's, I think there's just a lot more going on in here, a lot more dynamic for sure. But yeah, again, on the left hand side, it's like it's got that atmosphere where I don't know, it's just crazy. Like if I was painting this piece on the left, I'm not sure I would even think of having this like really light, misty sort of hue to break up the middle ground. You know, um, I would pro it would probably just be all black and all like really dark, and then maybe the light on the um, you know, like the belt on the back and sort of the, the traps of this weird sort of orky character. Mm -hmm. um, just like you say, just the confidence in or seemingly confident decisions that he has of breaking stuff up is just it, just insane to me. Just so beautiful. And the way it glistens off the, um, uh, you know, the, the Viking dude's legs and everything. Just the lighting is just so good, man. He does the best butt cheeks I think I've ever seen. <laughs> He does, man, because it's <laughs> it's got that ovular shape, and then it, ah, oh, man, it's yeah, it's yeah. way harder than it looks to try to replicate. Yeah. It. yeah, he literally does just the best, like the back angles as well, like even just the angles that he chooses of like from behind, and you've got you know the just the way the thigh is and just perfectly smooth that you know kind of juts out and in, and ah, oh, just incredible, absolutely incredible stuff. And on the left side, I mean, it's 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 very earthy, right? Mm. How often, you know, do most artists fall into doing really vibrant colors all the time? Which, I mean, I love that stuff, no doubt. And if that's your style, uh, like it oftentimes is mine, like really vibrant, you know, that's, that's cool. But that's why the strength of lighting and obviously like um, you know, the figures themselves – but man, the values are really what carry almost all mm. of his pieces. Yeah, exactly. That's a very good point. I mean, if you look at the contrast between these two pieces, just look at the colors in the fire and ice piece. It really lends itself well to the different characters and tying in the different colors, like the leopard print um, sort of loin uh, cloth thing that this ball has, and um, you know the hair of the the, the sort of the character, the blonde haired character, and everything. And, it's just, but then compare that to this one on the left, where it's quite not monotone, obviously, but just um, very atmospheric and it's all very dingy and dark, um, just by virtue of the con the subject matter, you know, like tying that all in and you it, it really feeling like you're in a dark, dingy cave somewhere, you know. Yeah. Um, a a really good. Uh guy to look into if you feel inclined um unlike youtube and looking up interviews is a guy named jeffrey watts uh, but he has a watts atelier so it's like a you know it's an art school that's in person but it also does virtual lessons but he's done some streams with uh david finch um proko oh, cool. so stan prokopenko and anytime he talks you just get so much wisdom from it so i mm. uh, highly recommend to any artist uh just listen to this guy talk you know but he talks about how once you're at a certain level as an artist he doesn't really believe in the concept of like muddy paintings he's like yes some people could describe like that thing on the left as being muddy but okay. to me i see it as organic and value driven you know like yeah yeah i just i think some people obsess too much about the word you know like muddy colors Whereas if you look at life, everything has a little bit of a sense of like, you know, green isn't truly green. Green is, you know, yellow, brown, and then some mm. green mixed in, you know, like you're talking about analyzing a tree, right? Well, yeah. the tree is full of muddy colors. So I just think that if you can get the values right on a piece, worrying about the colors that go along with it as long as you're doing good technical application if you're doing watercolor or gouache or oil painting you mm. shouldn't you shouldn't shy too much away from getting earthy tones that's just kind of my take on it i'm no expert but um 100 agree 100 yeah. i mean i actually really like doing quite muted uh, monotone colors it's only when I'm doing a commission, they say, oh, can you make this really bright and eye-catching? And sometimes, you know, sometimes I have to kind of bite my tongue and 
think, you know, at the end of the day, I'm doing a commission, you know, sometimes the customer is right or, you know, sometimes what they want is a bit more important than what I want, you know. But um, I would totally be more uh, inclined to do something like on the left where it's very dark and dingy and it's just all, like you say, value driven. Um, yeah. Still so striking, you know, it's like not got these mad sort of kind of colors jutting out in the background to add contrast, but it doesn't need it because you feel like you're in a dark, darkly lit room you know you're not going to have these really bright random colors just coming out of nowhere you know you mention a tree and you look at it you know when you're in a forest you're not going to have loads of bright you know pop purples and it's going to be browns and oranges and you know it's it actually almost adds more to atmosphere in a way yeah 100 percent, man i think the most common example is i see people you know man so the thing with watercolor I've noticed is there's like watercolor, you know, illustrators and fine artists. And then there's a lot of people who are like, you know, selling stuff on Etsy and it's like cutesy watercolor, that kind of stuff. I, I, I'm going to be frank, man. I, I despise that shit. Yeah. I, I, I absolutely hate it. And then I love like moody watercolors. So like sometimes I'm, when I tell people about I'm like into watercolor and they're like, oh, me too. And then I see their stuff. I got to bite my tongue. So I'm like, oh my God, I hate this shit. Like, yeah. I don't like that stuff. I like it when there is a sense of atmosphere. You're not afraid to mix colors. You're not afraid to, like, have that sense of atmosphere. So, yeah, maybe maybe I'm being elitist right now, but, man, like, <laughs> that's, kind of, that's kind of why I love those, like, you know, value-driven pieces, especially with mm. the color. That's right. And I think you're right. You know, whenever, whenever someone mentions watercolor, you do imagine just those, you know, framed pieces of like flowers that you see yes. in a charity shop where it's just really just garish sort of colors, but, you know, lots of whites and pinks, purples and yellows and stuff. And it's just so boring and there's just no depth to it, you know, really sort of almost ethereal, but not even in a cool atmospheric sense, just like there, there was no passion involved. It was just, you know, it's a craft project, you know. Like that mm, kind of exactly, yeah. <laughs> I 100% agree. I, I don't even care if we sound elitist right now. Those kind of watercolors can do one. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, as an artist, you got to have opinions, right? You got to know what you yeah. like and what you don't like. Yeah, it's not to say that the people that create that are assholes or anything. It's just not my style, you know? Yeah. It's like we all have a preference. And, um, and yeah, like I say, man, like I could have, I could have suggested like, dozens of artists for us to look at um but i found that frazetta was sort of they were at both sides of the spectrum for me so you know i've got really like deliberate um sharp graphic art and then you've got really atmospheric just very painterly sort of work essentially so that's why i picked those two yeah speaking of frazetta have you seen like so his uh when he was getting into comic books and inking and stuff have you seen like some of his tarzan pieces from oh, like the sixties, yeah, man, amazing, absolutely amazing. That like that's where Wrightson got his stuff, you know. I mean, that's, that's yeah, what I yeah. see. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's very similar, sort of quite voluptuous, like expressive uh, anatomy. But obviously, then when you get into the finer details, it's just just crazy. Like, but Bernie Wrightson was another one I was kind of going to have in, in between the two, you know, um, and just so many different. Like there's so many classical artists as well that I just love, and people probably think I might, I might not even like him. Like you know, Dali, I, I love his work. You know, it's just so insane because it was abstract and surreal and atmospheric, but so precise as well and sharp in places where it needed to be. Um, Goya, I love Francisco Goya's work. It's just super bleak. I mean, I actually didn't realize he did nice work before before that. Before those dark pieces, before he yeah. died, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, not to go off on too of a tangent, but um, yeah, Goya essentially became more of a recluse and he um, he basically just cut himself off from everyone. And then he did those, the, what you call the black paintings or the black pieces or whatever. So it was like 14, yeah. just really bleak, just disgust, like a sat is it Saturn eating? Saturn, his yeah. Yeah. So iconic. Um, yeah. So just bleak and just horrifying but yeah before that he was just he did some really beautiful like work you know almost um uh, i'm trying to think of uh, another artist very sort of like you know flemish style sort of paintings you know like 
very floral and you know lots of sunlight and just sort of beaming you know landscapes and stuff but yeah just super inspiring man how could you not be inspired by so many different artists yeah well here's the part where you guys start blushing because we're going to talk about your work all right god damn it (laughs) (laughs) all right so up first actually need to start in order Here's a preview for everybody. Um, Brand of Sacrifice, right? Yes, yeah. So were these commissioned around the same time, kind of like you know, a pair of pieces or a separate? Yeah, pieces? yeah. It was like a whole bulk of uh, three pieces, so one yet to be released. But um, yeah, it was essentially uh, my take on their last few single and excuse me, uh, e- the EP cover, um, and. Yeah, just by virtue of their music, it's... Um, I'm not sure if you're a fan, and obviously it's like Deathcore, but they've got very a f- kind of a futuristic, dystopian yeah. sound to them. You know, lots of... Uh, the choirs and shit. Yeah, 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 it's really like... You know when you used to watch 80s films and there was a scene where it was the most ridiculous, futuristic music, but it was yeah. really all over the shop, and you would listen to it and think, that that's not what music would be like. I imagine Brand of Sacrifice to actually be that, but the, the realistic version, you know, and how actually sick it would be being in the future now and listening to music. That's what they sound like to me. Um, but anyway, yeah, the work itself was, um, if you look at the uh, cover on the left, or sorry, the, the uh, merch piece on the left, it's based on their cover Exodus, the the single cover, and it's like, I think it's a 3D artist that's done it. So it's like this just weird, crazy tech stuff just coming out of this dude's mouth. Um, so it's just my interpretation um, and just, yeah, just adding more of a bleak, dystopian vibe to it. Uh, and the piece on the right is their EP cover. So their latest EP, it's got quite a, quite a beautiful looking woman with like her face being cut out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I can't remember the name of the artist, but um, she actually it's photo manipulation, but she does just some amazing work with it. She always kind of cuts out pieces of like really ornate armor um, and like photography. And I think, um, yeah, just messes with stuff like that. But she creates just, just these really intricate pieces. Um, so then I obviously just did my own just messed up version. <laughs> But yeah. super fun, lots of creative freedom. Uh, I just did a rough sketch, uh, and yeah, that was just cool to go. Kyle from the band, like, I've worked with him before. He's just super chill, a really nice bunch of guys. Um, yeah, I just, I just wanted to do something really techy and dystopian. I really love drawing machinery. Um, and going back to what I said earlier about trying to imagine how things work mechanically, like... Todd McFarlane's really good at doing machinery and guns that are just so impossible. Like, they wouldn't work in real life because they're so impossible, right? Right. But I like to kind of create machinery and tech that kind of looks like it, it would actually function in the real world. I don't know why. I just like, I just kind of gives me uh, some catharsis when I'm I making I think I would fall and do, oh, this looks cool. I'm going to do it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah. Uh, my friend Jerry at uh, Wormwalk, he does some really awesome artwork. He got me into uh, Jeff Darrow, who was um, part of the art direction for The Matrix. But if oh, you want to wow. look at a, I, I don't know if you're familiar, but Jeff Darrow, he has a great eye for um, contour drawings that have a lot of sense of realism. Mm. Uh, kind of like what I'm seeing on the left here. So t- take a look at his stuff. You'll see his machinery is um, one of his strengths. But yeah, cool. I mean, with these pieces, dude, it's just unreal um, how much detail goes into them. And I'm sure, you know, what's the most common thing that people say about, you know, your pieces that aren't artists? They're like, oh, it's so detailed. And it's like, <laughs> yes, it is. But there's also a great sense of form, of course. There's the emotion, the hand on the one on the left carries a lot of emotion. There's nice. almost something biblical about the one on the right. Um, so it, it, it captures a lot of emotion and tone. Mm. Would you call these more of your digital illustrations or paintings? Cause you, you seem to have a little bit of a differentiation in terms of like how you approach them. I, I didn't know how you would define these. Yeah, I guess I would call them, uh, digital paintings, but I've, 
I'm still learning now, and thanks so much for the kind words, man. I really appreciate it, first and foremost. Um, yeah. I'm just trying to kind of merge, in a way, my graphic style of linear shading and hatching with painted work. Yeah. Um, and obviously, just by virtue of there being, you know, metallic objects here, obviously, it will look more graphic than some of my other stuff, which might be a bit more open and has got more... Um, you know, of a background, uh, like, you know, like rocks and mountains and stuff in the background or whatever. But, um, yeah, I don't know what I would call it, dude. I guess just digital painting. But like I say, I've, um, you know, I drew all these individual pieces out. I actually did uh, a live stream of part of this, but I've actually recorded the entire painting process. So um, I'll try and upload the, I kind of try and do reels every now and then showing like a really fast time lapse. So I'll yeah. try and upload those at some point. It's just a lot of editing and obviously with everything else, I get too busy, but um, yeah, just, I really like, I've always just loved drawing mechanical things and just getting really stuck into um, intricate details. I just find it super um, therapeutic um, and I'm still always learning. Like I find I'm very confident, not to sound arrogant or anything, but I'm confident with figure drawing now. Like I can be really expressive and I can come up with an idea in my head and just really like, kind of nail it you know um quite easily but when it comes to yeah. tech sort of stuff i'm i i feel like i'm still learning and just it's just so much fun almost engineering and building something that could be a real machine you know i've just always always loved that um do you make it, a habit of looking up reference for machinery or it, is it more intuitive figuring it out for each piece it's quite intuitive, yeah. I mean, sometimes when I get stuck, I'll look at, like, maybe an engine, like a V8 engine from a, an American muscle car or something because there's just so many, like, different tubes and shapes coming out of it or something. Yeah. Um, and again, going back to my childhood, my, my dad had car parts everywhere. Like, it was just – there was so much material to look at and analyze in terms of machinery and stuff like that. Um, so I've always – really try to hone in on like really sharp angular shapes and stuff in perspective, trying to nail that as well. So this, this was just like so fun in that sense, like getting the perspective, right. You know, engineering this sort of, um, this weird sort of armor and different like joints and stuff like that and tubes and everything. That was super fun. And then obviously I try and, I try and kind of inject some sort of neoclassical edge to everything that I do. Yeah. Um, I love drapery and, you know, cloths and stuff like that. I think it just adds flow and everything to it. Um, so this one on the right, I was able to, I think, hopefully merge the two, like, you know, neoclassical with, you know, really sort of futuristic dystopian um, themes. Totally. That's definitely um, what I see. Did you do any um, mirroring and then break the mirroring for, like, the hand? Like, just so you had uh, the distance between the head and these appendages like equal oh, yeah, or do you sure. eyeball it? Okay. Yeah. So the, the one on the left was far more dynamic. And I'd, obviously I had to just draw everything um, uh, by itself, but this one on the right, I kind of got the, I basically got the rough anatomy down and mirrored it and then just made sure like, yeah, like the distance from each side, because obviously a face could either be go like this or like this, depending on how you've drawn it. So I made sure that was all copacetic. And then, um, I think I pretty much, because again, like I had three of these to do, so I did actually paint quite a lot of it and then mirror it over. But then when it came to the character underneath it all, I just did that all from scratch and just by itself, you know, without any mirroring or anything like that. Yeah. Well, you just add some dynamic, you know. I think that's key because, you know, sometimes uh, I'll see people and procreate. I'm not, I'm not trying to criticize, right? It's just... I'm sure my take is it's you know procreate has that uh, tool where it's very easy to just have everything completely symmetrical whereas yeah. i think it's cool if you have enough symmetry and then you break mm -hmm. it in deliberate places because then you get that nice balance point like to me that would be like anytime i see somebody do that it's like okay use that tool but then eventually break it um and it would make a more dynamic piece 100% dude yeah you see some sort of like uh more smaller kind of up and coming artists where um you know obviously everyone's got time constraints and everything but they will just do half and just mirror it over and it does just again not to um not to 
cast aspersions on any artist doing whatever they do, but I, I do think it can look a bit lazy sometimes where they've just mirrored it exactly. Yeah. I think adding a bit of dynamic, I think, just makes it much more um, interesting to look at, you know. It doesn't even need to be a lot. Like, no. Because like, no. it, it could yeah. be prime, like it could be even 90%, just like those little touches, I think, um, add a lot. I don't know if I'm singling anyone out, but just <laughs> I, I'm working on a primarily symmetrical piece right now, so it's just very top of mind. Oh, okay, um, yeah. So I'm and just that, thinking, cool. You mentioned in Procreate, I've seen someone do like really sick mandalas and stuff with it, which is really cool because it, it fits the purpose, right? It's right. that's what it's made. That's what it's made for, so that's fine. But yeah, I think if you're doing like a figure drawing or something like that, then have some dynamic, you know, make it a bit more organic in that way. You know, nothing's going to be perfect, perfectly symmetrical in life, you know? 100%. So what we got next? Okay, so I picked this one in particular <laughs> because this I saw... <laughs> I know, I, all right. So the thing on the left is 2017. The thing on the right is 2022. Now, here's the thing. The thing on 2017 is still very good. The thing on the right is exceptional. Now, if I may, you. you got kind of similar subject matter, right? You have mm -hmm. a figure behind a woman kind of like um, consuming it of some sort. You have some pieces. It looks more like uh, oh, that's trees on the right there. But I guess my point is it really is a good as close as possible apples to apples comparison of your development over the last right. five years going from in my opinion, like a um, artist with a lot of potential to a professional illustrator to be reckoned with. That's what I see here. Now, I'm not trying to toot your horn too much because I know you got, you know, loads more to keep growing. So don't, you know, we talked about this earlier. Don't cap off, but no, that's all good. it's I really cool appreciate to see it. this. Mm, thanks a lot. Yeah, like it's painful for me to look at, obviously, but at the same time, it is cool. Like it's, you know, I think as artists, we don't, take stock as much as we should sometimes i think we should look back on our our work and just see like where we've grown for sure like i need to do it more um but yeah so the piece on the left is like i just look at it and i think the main thing that's changed is patience for me yeah um i think that's just the biggest the biggest change in how i approach my work like i just look at the, the way <sighs> There's just I th I really like the anatomy of the woman actually on the left. I think that's a really good pose. The proportions are still pretty good. I've nailed that pretty well. But it's just like the details, man. Like the wings. I think uh, that I could have I could have blended out the really dark fills a bit more. Um, obviously the trees in the background. I think I drew those in with my tablet, and then it was just you know messing around with contrasting colors. Um, but yeah, you're right. I think the the main sort of composition is there for sure, and I do like I like the way it's framed and everything. Um, but yeah, I think the, the the biggest way that I've grown is just patience. I think that's just been. I mean, the, the piece on the left, I was probably still in my sort of wayward kind of drug addict phase where I wasn't really doing a lot of work. I would probably like think of an idea and I would spend time on it, but I would just rush it. And I would then just not do anything again for a few weeks. That was like a time in my life where I wasn't really dealing with any of my trauma. I was just, you know, in, in full drug escapism mode. So I really didn't spend a lot of time on artwork. Yeah. And so, and, and it's, again, it's a good, healthy thing to look, for me to look back on, actually. It's quite an interesting reminder about how I've grown and how I've changed because you contrast to the piece on the right. And I've really dedicated myself to my work. And as much as I hate to in my own talk, like my own horn, it's um, you can see I've really spent time on this piece. You know, I've spent I mean, I spent how many hours? I think maybe easily maybe 30 hours on that piece, I think. You could have told me 100 and I would have believed you. <laughs> but yeah, really just honed in on different textures. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm still very proud of that piece. I probably I would have. Uh, I struggled actually with some of the trees in the background and some of the cloth from uh, the Grim Reaper in the back. Trying to balance that out yeah. um, was quite tough. A lot of the black fills were done sort of after when I realised, you know, I could I could add a bit more contrast. Yeah. The um, 
the cherubs or like you know little angelic and demonic sort of characters um i initially had the shading on those hatched um, and i'd actually did a sort of i'd finished them in the hatched style and then i kind of realized what i like to maintain is like dot shading with skin texture and i, I like to that. maintain linear shading for like cloth and you know sort of more i don't know is it granular i guess textures so I messed up at that point and I was like, damn, like I've, I'm not going to maintain my sort of quintessential textures. So I then had to go in really deep black fills way more than I would have and then carried on some of the dot shading. So I kind of find that they're kind of getting lost in the background a bit. Um, and then it was kind of a juggling act of the rest of it, then adding more black fills. So it was all, you know, it was all sort of merged nicely. Yeah, but at the same time, like you, we, for Zeta, man, he he would paint something and then he had to completely obscure it. So how really different is it from you doing that with the cherubs? It's just the fact that you know you didn't do that intentionally, that you're mad at yourself. I wouldn't think anything of it, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, dude, it looks great. And like the eye immediately goes to three things. It goes to the Reaper. It goes specifically to the uh, abdomen, the chest area of the woman. Mm. And the, man, that sense of flow is perfect. And the slope of that uh, body is so natural. You Thanks can so really much. feel the weight of the rest. And then the, the, the crescent moon. Mm. Um, so, I mean, I'm not saying that what you're saying is invalid. It's just those details at the end of the day, when you're looking at it from this size, they don't matter as much. Um, and yeah, I have noticed that. I, I put it on the comment on the, the question sheet, but just the fact that you do have that signature stippling. And then mm -hmm. I always see you doing hatching, but I never see you do cross hatching. So I, it, it's just interesting how um, clean your rendering style is and also the consistency of it. Oh, I think to say about that? Um, yeah, I don't think it was really deliberate at first. I Just from comics, I guess. I mean... I never really used to see so much cross hatching. Uh, you kind of used to, in my mind, you see a lot more cross hatching in terms of illustrations in books and stuff like that. But yeah. I find with graphic artists, like if you look at, say, Jim Lee and uh, Lionel Yu and like McFarlane, it, I don't know if they really did a lot of cross hatching per se. But um, so, and again, just thinking of um, how I could differentiate texture and separate things, I figured. You know, obviously, when you look at, like, the fibers of a T-shirt or something, you know, you kind of see the lines when you zoom in. Um, so I figured that would work. And like I say, going back to, like, always having some form of drapery or cloth in my work, I think it just ties in that neoclassical theme. Um, and then, yeah, juxtaposing that with some dot shading. And again, skin having pores and it being quite uh, granular in that sense. Um, it just made sense to me. I'm not sure why. Um, and I see a lot of artists where, again, no aspersions or shade on them. It's like you either normally get it's all dot shaded, all stippling, or it's all um, uh, hatching. hatching or, yeah. Um, I, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, you might know someone, but I've not seen many artists that actually juggle both. And to be fair, actually, Hawkey, I think he does as well. He makes well, quite a lot. I mean, Horky, Sawblade, uh, Creep from Six Feet oh, Deep, they're sure. good examples of, of variety in uh, rendering techniques. Yeah, true. And, yeah. Like, and like, frankly, those are like my three – well, you as well, frankly. Um, if I'm looking at like how to render something really smoothly, I'll look at your guys' piece and I'll, I'll study them. Because mm. I think I they're some of the best out there um, in terms of doing that right now in this mm -hmm. kind of scene. But yeah, um, the other thing was it the moon you wanted to? Uh, did you ask about the moon? Well, yeah, I've noticed all the original pieces that you have on your website. They all have the crescent moon, so I was just wondering why you're drawn to that. Yeah, so I don't know why I I've always been gravitated to that shape of the moon. It just has like an occult vibe to it. You know, when you look at really sort of ritualistic satanic art, it's always, you know, nighttime, but it's always got like like this moon and obviously satanic symbolism and stuff. But I don't know, I've always just been drawn to it. And in a sort of in a very basic way, I kind of just wanted it to differentiate from my commission work. You know, I do so much commission work and I just want some, I wanted something 
emblematic of it just being my work you know i was it, right. it was a commission this is something that i've spent t- my own time on um and yeah i just it's i don't know someone might think it's a bit of a cop-out but it just feels always fills that space really nicely and just by virtue of working in subject matter that's at night time or sort of dark and transgressive it's always sort of dark and at night time so it just i just feel it works and it just adds a just adds a graphic distinctive symbol i think to my work where you know you can see every piece of mine hopefully people can be like that's a shindy piece because it's got a moon in it <laughs> yeah <laughs> very basic i guess but um yeah I've, I've always just been drawn to that shape um yeah, that's cool sometimes that's just enough i like yeah. it and it's a signature <laughs> yeah yeah, thanks, dude. Yeah, again, I like, just yeah, blown away by all the, all the all the compliments and stuff. Like, still feels like I'm in my infancy and in, in terms of learning. Still, you know, I, I, it never feels like yeah, I've learned enough or like yeah, I've really killed that piece or anything. Uh, you're always keep that as long as you can, man. Yeah, for sure. Again, like you say, competition. It's like almost a uh, an intrinsic self competition, right? You're competing with yourself, and you know that's what makes you get up the next day and. And draw again. Otherwise, you why would you carry on? You just give up. You know, you'd be like, "Cool, I'm I'm really sick. That's it now." <laughs> yeah, exactly, man. What do we got next? So I see uh, on the left here this is a zenith passage. Pass- I keep doing that lisp when I say it. Zenith passage. That's oh the God. one. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, on the left here with the um, veil, it did remind me a little bit of that. Like I saw a little yeah. bit of a similarity personally, but, um, and then that album on the right, that's the, um, you know, the cover there that just came out what on Friday. Uh, well, this uh, is yes, a week or so. July ago. 30th. Yeah. Mm. But, uh, I was listening to that album yesterday cause, uh, I hadn't checked it out, but I was pretty impressed by it. I thought it sounded really good. Yeah. Really great band. And of course it's, you know, it's been a long time coming, right? I think it's been seven years, I think or something since their last record. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was super fun to work on. Um, the piece on the left again, like I just wanted to tie in the neoclassical feel to it. Um, I can't remember if they had a brief per se. I think they sort of, gave me the rough premise which was us being you know slaves to the algorithm and technology so that was sort of the basic brief and then um me almost selfishly thinking right i want to do more neoclassical work i'm going to tie in the neoclassical feel i don't want it to just all be tech um futuristic and you know again it kind of it gets a bit boring when you look at tech death art where it's a bit samey, you know, it's all sort of machines and techie sort of, you know, neon colors and stuff like that. Right. Um, so I kind of just wanted to do something a bit more, uh, just a bit more different and striking. So yeah, just tying in that sort of almost like, you know, Catholic Mary sort of get up, you know, cloth and, and drapery having that sort of almost, you know, what you'd kind of think of as intrinsically pure and beautiful from like old, you know, biblical paintings against something really cold and just rotting and just grim. That's just something I I put forward to the band pretty early on um, and they loved it. They were like, yeah, that's really sick. Um, let's do it. So then I kind of like my usual thing, just fleshed it out roughly. Um, I had the kind of basic iconic image of like, you know, a Mary in the middle and then something just to frame the, the, the background. Um, and what I love about classical art is just these really melodramatic contorting bodies and poses. It just adds just so much more emotion to a piece, you know, so much more, um, yeah, melodrama and just, um, grimness to the whole piece, you know, that really foreboding sort of feeling of this, yeah, this tech sort of God coming to, you know, eat the earth or something. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) It's it's so cool, and actually, it might be one of my favorites of yours, the one on the left. I think I just love the contrast of that like '80s retro grid thing, yeah, right. with with the the muted colors and the atmosphere that you're seeing there, and then obviously the bodies like all support it. Like it's just such a powerful image, and like thanks so much, dude. Oh, so, man, it's uh, it's um, just so cool. So the actual '80s sort of. Um 
uh, what do you call it, Infinity Mirror thing was actually put forward by the band. So originally yeah. it was just, I did have contrasting colours in the background. It did have, so it have that almost rainbow-esque sort of uh, gradient. Um, and yeah, they, they just said something about an Infinity Mirror. Uh, and I was, at first I was a bit jarred by it. I was like, oh, I don't know if that's going to make it look a bit cheesy. But yeah, it, it works so perfectly. Like you say, it really just juxtaposed the you know like future and old time right like ancient and futuristic it really just adds to that and it just frames the the background really nicely so i'm really stoked on that this is actually one of my personal favorites as well actually so i'm really stoked you chose it now how did you accomplish that then so was that all digital then and everything else you know you did the the drawing by hand yes that background yeah, so I think, again, I, I don't think I actually penciled any of this. I can't remember. be pretty unforgiving if you, you know, misaligned a dot, if you, <laughs> you hand yeah, it right. in. Yeah, I think I just drew this digitally, I think, um, and then just went straight in with painting. Yeah. Um, I just built up the layers like I normally do, yeah. I've got a very uh, – it's not the best time lapse, but I think I've got a time lapse on my Instagram of painting. I think the – bodies on the bottom half um yeah super fun to work with um yeah i really enjoyed that piece earthy tones i just love earthy tones like i said before as well so it was really like a passion piece for me this one and like the subtle detail of the kind of dust collecting up to bridge mm -hmm. between the figure and the uh distorted figures at the bottom so cool yeah that was actually for once where i was that was actually quite deliberate where i was I was thinking about what I said earlier about actually breaking things up and adding a bit of atmosphere. It just looked far too static with just this really dark shading, you know, and I, I'm always learning, man. Like literally like a few weeks ago, I was thinking like why my landscapes aren't great. I, I don't do a lot of landscapes. Sometimes in the background of a piece like this, I'll add something in the background. Um, and I realized one of my downfalls was having them detailed and having them quite starkly shaded Whereas yeah. really, you know, if you look in the distance, everything gets lighter and more mistier and more ethereal, right? Yeah, Especially if it's in daylight. Yeah, you see that sort of blue haze and just natural sort of air or displacement of air just kind of breaking things up. Um, so that's something I wanted to do here and just add to the scale of this um, antagonist, you know, like to make him feel more giant without that he looked very like still in the foreground and very like it just didn't have that gigantic monolithic feel to it um so yeah thanks dude i'm, I'm really i'm glad you picked that out because that was something that really helped the piece um and I'm, I'm glad i put that in there for sure yeah um the thing on the bottom right is that that bound in fear piece that you were talking about that kind of helped you or am i getting the bands mixed up no, yeah, that is um, that is Bound in Fear. That's not the first cover I did with them, but that I think that's the... It's kind of a combination of the second and the third because the left-hand image was the front cover of the previous album, right? Mm -hmm. And then the right-hand side was then the album and it was sort of like a con continuation of the story or something. I thought it was the gatefold. I thought if you opened it up, it and then would it was be... Gatefold. Yeah, so basically they had the Eternal EP, which was the, the head and the stuff coming out on the cover, and then Penance, which was the album. So then when you had the EP and the album together, you would get that, and then also on the gatefold of the last album, you would see both as well, so it kind of all tied it in together. Sick. But yeah, that was uh, another crazy, crazy piece. Um Another personal favorite of mine, for sure, actually. As much as I self-deprecate, um, I really do like this piece. I think I put a lot of um, emotion in it. Um, and, yeah, not uh, to go into some of the backstory, like, I, you know, as I mentioned before, I've struggled with drug addiction and suicide. And so it was just a really cathartic piece, and it tied in a lot of the backstory of the, the band and what they were going for with the album as well. Um, so it was just a really therapeutic cathartic piece even though it's so dark and obviously very grim um yeah i just i put a lot of time and emotion into this piece and i think it um i think it reflects that which i'm really stoked for even the background so i kind of there was a bit of sort of copy pasting and basically using the copy brush because obviously i 
I just didn't have the time to paint, you know, millions of tombstones. <laughs> but um, yeah, I essentially painted like sort of a, I think it was like a 10 by 10 digitally of like this graveyard. Um, so then that was to be used on the inlay image. It was just really extensive. So it was that, obviously, the, the centerpiece or the, the foreground artwork. And there's, so there were some other pieces I did for the inlay, like a really sort of dreamy, nightmarish scene of an ocean um, and some of the tombstones coming out um, and all just staying within the same sort of colour theme, obviously. Really dark, dingy, muddy colours just to really add the um, just the feeling of just despair and just grimness. A little um, bit of spark of fire adds a, adds a nice little spice to it as well. Nice. Thank you, dude. Yeah. You've got the little door that says it's like an old home sweet home, but I've, you know, scribbled that out and put home sweet hell, you know, like really like just grim on the nose, despair and suffering, which is something that I don't like to do all the time. You know, I, I actually... I don't like gratuitous violence or like slam bands, man. Like the amount of stuff where it's just women being torn up by chainsaws and dildos and shit. Like I just, I'm not into that. But stuff yeah. like this where it's visceral and it's dark, but it's, it's, you know, it's got emotion behind it. That's some of my favorite things to yeah, do. Yeah, I'm with you. I think the negative space also like makes it so readable, you know? Mm. Um, like it's not just chaos everywhere it's chaos in a very specific shape broken up by you know thousands of smaller shapes and then you got the the hand and the and the lady so i think it's just um the composition right from the get-go like that basically the decisions you made within the first 15 minutes made the piece successful in in the ultimate form if you had made bad decisions in that first 15 minutes you would have spent, you know, hundreds of hours basically making something that never would have been as strong. For sure. Yeah. Thanks so much, dude. That's a really good point. Um, we really wanted to work on the flow of it as well, right? So you can see there's a flow of it going to and from. It's not as chaotic as, you know, you might imagine it to be. Um, I worked really hard on that. And, um, yeah, I'm really stoked with it. I'm really proud of that piece. Um it was it's always tough juggling that amount of those amount of components you know it's always it just gets harder and harder but i th i really i chose really dark stark lighting precisely for that just so everything did have its own place yeah. if that was you know if it had like multiple light sources like up and down it just would have been such a mess like you know i'm pretty confident in lighting but i think i would have struggled for sure if there was one with more than one light source you know yeah and you didn't do any reference for lighting on this or did you take like a picture just to like have something to go off of um no i think it was pretty much just uh intuitive for me um i i've always i started off doing very stark simon bisley was my favorite because it was always like top down lighting very stark shading and like you could see the cheekbones and everything so yeah i did that with the face at the beginning that was like the first um mapping out of lighting that i did and then everything sort of fell into place i think actually on the far on the far right there is another slight kind of um slither of light just to break up the the anatomy uh, from the background just because i found the hand you know we wanted some power to to be added to the hand and the um the guy that's in the palm of uh, the hand as well so there's kind of like a little slither of light just to so you can see the outline but that's it yeah that's that's remarkable man lighting is, is definitely not one of my current strengths at least i don't think so i i think using reference for me is, is very helpful. I think a lot of it is just so I don't, um, I have, I have more confidence in my decisions if I have just a little bit more, uh, lighting reference, like I'll maybe even just do something and then I'll completely deviate from it. But it's just nice having something that's a little more objective to come back sure. to if yeah. you start like second guessing yourself and, and keep in mind too, man, I'm doing, this isn't about me, but I do everything by hand. So my mistakes mm. are not forget they're, you know, I can't oh, sure, dude. I can't undo button. So that's <laughs> yeah. that's the other part of it too that 
know, it, it does make it harder. So I think that's why I uh, maybe do more reference on the get go because then I can not have that. Oh, did I fuck up? It's like, no, that's actually what it looks like. I need to, you know, dive deeper. I think that's great because I mean, like again, with your style and the stuff you do, it is surreal and abstract. But I think sometimes it's good to have parameters to stay within. Yeah. Um, especially with lighting because uh yeah you want to i think lighting adds so much power and um substance to a piece gives it weight you know uh, and especially when you're dealing with like the stuff that you do which is quite chaotic and surreal like you want each piece to be distinctive as well so with the, you know the, the lighting will do that for you and if you have a clear idea of where the lighting is everything else will just fall into place right and it gives it a sense of realism I think makes surreal art really good. You know, that's why Dali was so sick because, um, yeah, it's just because in terms of the realism of the lighting, it was so good, but the subject matter was just fucking batshit crazy. Um, yeah. I, there's an artist you've mentioned before that is your uh, big inspiration. Is it Trevor? Uh, what's his surname? So he's a tattoo artist and he does a lot of biro work. Trevor. Trevor. That's it, Trevor Bennett. Yeah, I and before you even mentioned his name in an episode, I could see the influence for sure. Like, just I just found his stuff recently. I just found a kindred really? spirit in terms of like how he thinks. Oh, that's crazy, man. Because yeah, when I saw your work, I initially thought, man, that reminds me of Trevor Bennett. Like, and again, just really crazy. Just, just it's insane. a stream of consciousness thing. You know, yeah, like, a like, really open, expressive, like no parameters in that sense, but the, just his shading and everything, man, is so sick. The, the size of one of his pieces, I've noticed, like, I don't, you can't even say how many inches it is, but it's fucking huge, but just so well done. Yeah, I, I really like his stuff. And he's a really nice guy, too. I reached out to him. I was like, hey, man, like, you've recently become one of my biggest inspirations. Um, I hope his mm -hmm. battle with cancer is doing okay. You, you know, one artist dude, you got to look up to, and um, I didn't mention earlier, but congrats on the, the tattoo apprenticeship, man. That's awesome. Oh, dude, thank you. Man. Look, up, look up Tony Mancia. He's an artist who used to be in Atlanta. Dude, you will love his stuff. It's, uh, okay. I think it the neoclassicism, the, uh, you know, study of female form. It's way up your alley, man. Man, you've mentioned so much cool stuff. Uh, I need to like make a note. I I'm going to message you after this and just um, we'll try. Hopefully, you can remember all of this, but I'll make a note as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, definitely him uh, for sure. Cool. Tony Mancia. Tony Mancia. Yeah. Let me write this down. Really friendly guy, too. Sorry, I don't mean to deviate and write a note. It's just I don't want to forget. Um, oh, no problem at all, man. How do you spell the surname? Uh, uh, M A N C I A. Oh, perfect. I guessed that perfectly. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks, dude. It took me a second. My American brand, I'm like, what's a surname again? <laughs> say last name. So I'm like, wait a second. Uh, there's been a couple of times even today, like, I, I, I love um, talking with people from like different countries because the way, uh, even if they're English speakers, they say different words. You know, <laughs> yeah. I got to like think about them for a second. Yeah, because you guys don't say herb properly. It's got a H in there, so you pronounce the H. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, when I was in the UK, do you guys say, um, instead of tank tops, do you say vests? Is uh, that a thing, we, or am I getting my stuff? Yeah, I think we say tank tops sometimes, but it's mostly vests. Um, yeah. Like taps, we never say faucet. That's that's a you thing, for sure. What we do you say call taps. Tap? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think what other idioms there are. Um, There's a ton of them, man. There is, yeah. Yeah, I'm blanking now. There's so many that they, they just, it makes me laugh. Like well, Sometimes it's it. even like the words you say, they mean the same thing in, uh, you know, American English, but it's just not the word that people use. You know, right. sometimes it's like they're substitute words, but then there's sometimes just like, you guys would say something where it would not be the common way we would say it, even though we know they mean the same thing, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, there's so many like that as well, definitely. Yeah. All right, so uh, Punks for Autism, we got two posters, right? Here? Uh, T-shirt designs, yeah. T-shirt, okay. Uh, 
Yeah, just tell me about them before I start yapping about them. Cool. So yeah, um, I had total creative reign with uh, with these, and um, yeah, if you don't know them, check them out. They do some really great work, man. Like raised a lot of money for kids with autism, and just yeah, by way of just really sick artwork from some of my favorite artists. Um, they've had like creep from Six Feet Deep, um, Colin Estrada. Uh, I think blank. Bargain been blast me, Matt Sticker. Yes, yeah, been blast me. I love that guy. So sick. Um, yep. Yeah, so many great peers and friends and artists that I love, which is awesome. Uh, and I guess yeah, it's same with them. I guess they just get total creative freedom, and it's just really cool to tie in. So, I mean, the stuff that I do isn't obviously overtly punk, um, but it's. I suppose it's still transgressive and punk in that in that sense, but. Um, yeah, I, I essentially approached these like uh, personal pieces. Yeah. Um, so neoclassical sort of scenes. Um, so the first one I did was the one on the right, and it came from. I don't do many sketchbook entries anymore, uh, just by because I just don't have enough time. But I did this really. Um, I did this kind of really rough sketch, a biro sketch of this guy. He looks way younger, um, and it was exactly the same sort of pose but then the demon character was way more like Beksinski sort of style uh, really sort of like skeletal and decrepit and grim um and uh yeah i just kind of i wanted to tie in more of my personal styles so and then i decided to, to add like a you know my quintessential i don't know what you'd call it like um is it sakubai or is it uh, there's a different word for it yeah it? no yeah yeah sakubai yeah yeah, that sort of vibe. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things I'd probably do differently now. I mean, I probably would have done it in dot shading. I just um, I just think I was quite busy at the time, so hatching was just quicker for me. But I still really like this piece. Um, and then I essentially just tried to rip off Aaron Hawkey in terms of the text. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, man, we're going to rip off anybody. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's tough doing text. Like, oh, my God. Um, I think I did a pretty good job, and I, um, I was, you know, I'm not trying to totally rip him off. I was trying to do my own thing, but I definitely, obviously, you would look at his work for inspiration uh, in terms yeah. of flow and everything. And um, I don't know. I look at it now, and I think it's too symmetrical. Um, I just don't think I would have gone for the symmetrical vibe. Um, but yeah, so then this one on the left is the most recent one. So that's the piece that you mentioned where I scribbled all over um, and did a oh, post. Oh, it was okay. It was that piece, yeah. So this is the the final version where I've totally redrawn it and I yeah recolored it and everything. Um, I'm way more pleased with the text work in this one. Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think it flows a lot better and it's and it's not symmetrical, but it still it balances itself out um, in terms of weight, which I quite like. Um, but yeah, so same sort of vibe to my personal stuff, really. I've got like a chaos, so to tie in the, the punk vibe, I've got a chaos star eye thing, which I actually took inspiration from an image I saw. I can't remember where it was. And I think I tried to find the artist actually to credit him or her. But there was like, sadly, there was no um, tag. There was no signature or anything like that. Um, and it was like pretty much identical to that. But it was like flesh, flesh colors very sort of um 40k warhammer sort of vibes yeah um but yeah that was it and the rest of it was just my own thing really just um adding in some cloth and bird skulls some sort of ritualistic paraphernalia like flowers and candles and stuff but um yeah i really like that that piece it's um uh symmetrical again but dynamic you know i've not i've not actually mirrored it or anything i've drawn each side separately and it has differences it's just pretty close. Yeah. No, I agree. I think your lettering stronger on the left side as well. I think it's because, you know, coming back to it, it has more uh, dimension. So the filigree has more dimension where it's more mm. um, flat and graphic on the right, which yeah, is still, right. it's still way better than anything I could do in terms of lettering. But like, I, I see what you mean. The one on the left is better. Thanks, dude. Yeah. Yeah. I'm getting, I, I don't get to do it that much, um, really. So I just been a long time. Really, the only time I've had a chance to just do my own text has been with these pieces. Obviously, when you're working with bands, they have their own late logos and, you know, they want it to be really big. So um, you don't get to, I don't get to explore that side, the graphic design side anymore, or the cursive typography side anymore. 
Um, but I'm going to try and do more of it because, um, yeah, I can definitely see I've got I've gotten better as much as I hate to do my own horn. I've definitely improved, so that's cool. Nice. I think we're getting down to the last couple. Um, I recall specifically seeing this one on the right. The uh, is it Illustrium? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I didn't know that was your work because I do think it's it's a bit different than your other stuff. But mm -hmm. this thing got a lot of praise on the album artwork. I recall some of my friends in the um, you know vinyl and CD collecting community. They were talking a lot of things about this particular piece. Oh, amazing! That's great to hear. And then you got, you know, a little more landscape on the left. So a little more out of your element than some of those other pieces. So you want to oh, talk yeah. a little bit about these two? Yeah. So uh, I think the one on the right was done before. And uh, that was, um, it's quite different. And I think it's the dynamic angle, I guess. It's like, you know, sort of zoomed in, but at a dynamic sort of uh, angle. Um, I just wanted to add add to the horror of it i guess in a way and it was a very sort of quick initial sketch the band loved it um and yeah i'm not sure i think um in terms of like the hand being larger and dripping this ooze i think that might have been something the band touched on um but i think that ugh, i can't remember it's done so long ago sorry give me a moment that's fine i mean the uh, lighting's what i think carries that one you know, obviously yeah. the composition's sick, but like the lighting is so confident and um, realistic. Thanks, dude. Yeah, I think, um, like I say, I like drawing hands, but I, I think I would have changed some of the angles on the hands and the lighting. But um, yeah, stark light, I, that was deliberate for sure, really stark lighting. So, you know, I wanted the face and sort of the main sort of few immediate hands to be very powerful and very like straight away in your face um and then the rest to kind of be like you would have to look that look at it a bit more yeah um, but yeah I, lo I love the dark feel of like the ooze coming into the into the mouth that's really cool it's really sick uh and the background was actually just an afterthought like i'd spent so much time on the foreground and getting the hands right and everything um and it worked out so well, I think, because it was an afterthought and because I was then thinking, right, I need to open this up a bit more. You know, rather than drawing the whole thing all together and then going in with the details in one fell swoop, I think it really lent itself to this piece where it's, it's kind of, it's way more painterly than a lot of my stuff. Yeah. Um, so I'm pretty stoked with that one. I've actually got it. You can probably see I've got the flag in the background as well. Um, oh, sick, yeah. Well, and the uh, fact that it's also like, um, so if we think about maybe like a 10 scale values, you know, that black ooze is like as black as it gets. Yes. And then right behind it, it's not like a five, it's more like an eight in terms mm -hmm. of like um, how dark it is. So it's just enough that you can see the black ooze, but it's not detracting anything. Thanks, Whereas man. I think yeah. that's really smart. That's great to hear, dude. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate it. And that was... Again, that was me really thinking, ah, oh, because I hadn't done that, you know, all in one fell swoop, like all the black values and everything, it really gave me a moment to actually kind of look back and think, you know, I still kind of wanted the black ooze not to be too in your face. I wanted it to be very seedy and sordid in that sense where you kind of really have to look and then see it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm stoked with that, man. Uh, I, like, it is an older piece now, so I, like I say, I probably would... I would maybe approach some of the hands a bit differently, but um, yeah, I, I'm glad you chose that piece. That's a cool one. And yeah, the one on the left, man, that was really like the first time I'd ever done any sort of architecture, landscape sort of piece. And um, yeah, that was uh, a, a tough one for me. That was yeah, super it's a different tough. type of challenge. Hundred percent, dude. Yeah, like just getting the background and. It took a lot of tweaking to get to where it was. Um, so the design of the actual castle, I, I got down pretty quick in terms of the angle perspective and everything like that. It was just juggling the light and the foreground and making sure that the snow was painterly so that the really sharp sort of rock faces were like really sharp. That would that I think initially was all very sharp and all very detailed and defined. 
and I had to go in all over again and actually think, actually, let me break this up a bit. Um, you know, let me add some mist um, and lighting. Uh, so, yeah, it's cool. I've, I always get a lot of compliments on that piece because I think because it is so different, you know. Um, and, yeah, that's with I've worked with the Sire uh, a couple of times since. Uh, and, yeah, we've got something else coming out soon. I obviously don't want to reveal too much, but that's going to be actually one of my most favorite covers in a long time actually it's kind of going to be i don't want to reveal too much but it's sort of that bound in fear sort of style so a lot of chaos okay um, and detail but i I've, i'm just really proud of this one it's super atmospheric as well um so yeah i cannot wait for that um but well, yeah that's, that's the thing too is man you got um you have repeat clients which means Ooh. that you must do a good job, not only with the art, but also the relationship management. So kudos there. Thanks a lot, dude. Uh, one thing that really struck me about John uh, Busima was how approachable and how professional he came across. Um, yeah. And that's an attitude I definitely, I carry as well, man. Like, you've got to be business minded. You know, you are working with people. You've got to be a people person. Like, you know, I'm sure if you're just dealing with really edgy death metal bands, you can just be a moody prick and it will be fine. It's all good. But like, I don't know, man. Like, and I'm, I'm only joking. I don't mean that at all. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I think you have to be malleable. Um, you know, you have to be open-minded, I think. You can't be too precious with stuff. You know, you have to be... You have to give them an experience where they think, okay, it was a challenge, but he was he did his best and he was really polite about it, and that's what brings clients back, man. Like you've got to, you've got to be business minded. I think nowadays, especially, I mean, you know, with AI and social media, you can get so lost in vanity metrics and worrying about the algorithm, um, and it just really the bare bones of it is the work that you do and how you actually interact with people man that's what matters none of that other stuff like how many likes you got or how many followers you have that doesn't matter what matters really is when a band comes to you and they come back again because they've had like a good experience and you know you you know you're not you've not only given them your, your best work but you've helped realize their ideas where they wouldn't be able to get that anywhere anywhere else you know Hundred percent, man. Couldn't have said it better. Thanks, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these are sick, man. Um, and I think I think you talked a little bit about the process of making them on the um, uh, Spearhead interview as well. But if you don't mind, a little recap for anyone who didn't see that. Okay, cool. Yeah, well, uh, obviously I knew the band before uh, they approached me. I think it was just after COVID or during COVID. Uh, with the piece on the left um and yeah from the get-go i was given a really ridiculous brief and it was way more intense than this it's like um, really long right yeah yeah it was like a whole paragraph <laughs> and, and, not, and that was amazing actually i actually prefer when the briefs are actually really detailed because uh, that then means i can either omit stuff or actually nail it and you know and it's better if someone has a clear idea of what they want rather than just saying do whatever you want because that can sometimes be a blessing and a curse sometimes where you're just like option paralysis, you know? Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Massive paragraph. It was like, yeah, it needs to be, it needs to be in a factory. There's factory workers all in overalls. There's a vortex, uh, like bird nest in the top with these bodies flying out. And then this big <laughs> monster ripping them apart and the black ooze is melting their flesh. And I was like, I was just reading this like, wow, that's, that's insane. Um, but I was like, do you know what? I think I can nail most of that. I think it was just the background. I think just because of how much, you know, he wanted to be happening in the image, I thought that a background would just distract from it and it would just be too much. Mm -hmm. Um, so I sent a sketch and it was very close to this. And the response was just laughter, like guffaw sort of laughter because it was like so insane. <laughs> And um, yeah, I absolutely loved it as well. I was like, man, this is going to be like the most craziest, elaborate, like, but really just dark and messed up piece I, I, I've done so far. Um, so that was ink, uh, pencil and ink. And yeah, I really worked tough. I really worked hard on the values because it was quite, 
it was tough to get like the, the black ooze, like having that really dark and prominent in there. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of inking, like, you know, how do you draw that when you've got other things like lighting of a face and hair and, uh, like cloth and everything. Uh, so that was super tough, man. And the smoke, like it was literally just me outlining it. Cause again, it just, I don't know. It just all works with this piece. Luckily it was tough, but yeah, I think I was just firing, like not to blow my own horn, but I was just firing on all cylinders that at that point. Um, and yeah, the blood at the end, like behind it was kind of an afterthought just to frame it, just to add to the chaos. Um, the design of like the bodies, like missing heads and stuff was mine and like the ghouls. And that was just hilarious to, to draw up and <laughs> think about. The, the, and a couple of things that I think really stick out too, you know, you can see the comic book influence, but the line mm -hmm. of action on the monster creature it's yeah. so cool with the bent back and then the mm -hmm. foreshortening of the factory worker's hand at the, uh, you know, on the bottom there. Mm -hmm. And then even the foreshortening of the monster's hand, you know, really well done there. Thanks so much, man. Yeah, that was something I really wanted to make sure was super dynamic, you know. And I think my initial sketch, he, he was, it was that post, but it was quite static. And I, I looked at it and I was like, it needs to be really like, you know, this piece was called the Hogan, funnily enough, afterwards, like Hulk Hogan, you know, when he rips the shirt. Yeah. Uh, and it was just that thing of like, you know, he's not going to be, you know, head down, neutral pose. It's going to be like really, really yeah. exaggerated. You, and know? you really can't even see that one arm well, which, you know, that to me, mm -hmm. that's one of the things that's so hard is like what you don't see is what messes with your head in a lot of cases. It's like, wait, should you see any of this arm? And it's like, no, because if you do see it, then it flattens it. But in your case, it's all chest out and that arm out, and it, yeah. it reads right, you know? That's it, and I really wanted to make sure, like, it looks like this body was being pulled, right? So you've got all the fibers and the sinew and everything, like, literally being almost flat against the chest at that point because it's just pushing forward, you know? That was... yeah super fun and i'm really really stoked on that one now this one on the right um we were talking earlier about uh like depth and like a little bit of atmospherics so like the the darkness in which you shaded the uh, body with the lighting in the front makes mm. it immediately pop out because you must have changed the ink color for the ones behind it to be just a little less um Exactly. Opaque or less black, but mm -hmm. like that's one of the things that I was um, impressed with with your work is you can create depth, even if um, you know it's still based more on the color uh, coloring on top of a pen and ink approach. Thanks so much, dude. Yeah, that was. Um, I think I drew the background characters totally separate because I wanted room to play around with that because I, you know, I did want to have some sort of depth. Um, I think I drew the uh, the center character twice. I think the first one I drew, I think it was top-down lighting. And then I realized because there's going to be so much stuff happening in the background, he's just going to get lost in, in all of that and, and the background, you know, the negative space. Yeah. Um, so I figured having that sort of, I think, like, almost behind and side-by-side -side lighting, it just creates that sort of halo effect across. It's like you know, kind of like behind and then a little mm. to the, at least my left here that's what it looks like to me yeah exactly so that was just so that you know that the the base shadow would just be in the center of all the you know the mass and the, the body parts so so that worked out really well and then yeah the bodies again like i said i drew it separately because i wasn't sure how much i'd include or take out um and there's a bit of i think i've only actually copied one of the bodies actually just to fill out some space and the really smaller ones in the very foreground where they you know they're not very defined they they were kind of done right at the end digitally uh they, they were just outlines before and again i just wanted to add that sort of that distance um i think if i was gonna if i if i'd have inked it i probably would have made the mistake of having the shading and everything and the hatching in there uh, so i think it helped that that was like at the end um yeah, another super fun piece. Like, uh, I got the lyrics for the song. Uh, which one was this? I'm trying to think of the name of the songs now. But um, I think I just read the lyrics and I got the idea of hands being the wings. Like, you know, something really obscene and just bleak. 
Um, and again, just sent the sketch to the guy, and he just, yeah, um, Oliver just loved the just the obscene nature of it. They didn't actually notice his little winky until like way after the <laughs> <laughs> post on Instagram, just being like, oh, like when you see it, thanks, Shindy. <laughs> like way That's after. Funny. That's quite funny. Um, it reminds me, you know what it looks like to me is, um, all right, let's say, you know, you've seen like the Nutcracker or some ballet, right? There's that moment where they're all like in a line and then they burst out. Oh, That's right. what I yeah, see. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It looks like a zombie ballet or something, man. Cool. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that's awesome. That's like the best uh, compliment for sure. <laughs> oh, and here's some close-ups. So, yeah, now you can see the uh, arm wings a little bit better on the one on the right and then some more detail of the monster and the factory workers. That's right, yeah. All right. And I think this and then this. Okay, we're, we're nearing the end here. I just realized I liked so much your work that I added more slides than usual. <laughs> Thanks so much, man. All right, so we got Sepultura and Creator um, with kind of a similar skull, you know. The yeah, one's a little more angled, but I, I realized, you know, the similarity after putting them there. Yeah, I've literally only just noticed that. That's crazy. It's funny how, you know, you only see this sort of stuff afterwards. Uh, so, yeah, Creator was – I was – I think it was a friend of mine actually. He was working with, um, he was working underneath the, man the management company. So he kind of hooked me up with that. Um, and yeah, obviously, I just love that old school sort of thrash vibe. It was, I think it was supposed to initially just be a tour poster. And I was given the title, which was State of Unrest. Mm -hmm. And then that was pretty much it in terms of um, brief or any sort of um, description. Uh, so I immediately just thought riots. And then once I kind of sketched out sort of the rough cityscape um, perspective, um, the manager wanted me to include the Riley G um, little tribute in there. Okay. Like, how it, yeah, man, R.A.P. Riley. Um, so yeah, I just realized. Nice. Yeah, man. Yeah. Such a great band. Um, yeah. Super fun piece. Uh, took a lot of time. Figuring out the cityscape, like it's something that you know, getting all the perspective right. I did use a reference for that, I believe, just because I mean, I could have spent hours trying to figure out what variation of you know face to, to use for a building front and windows and yeah. you know different sort of um, architecture, you know. So the distance I did use between the, the cars, you know, it's all those little things. Having something yeah. to fall back on is helpful. Exactly, yeah. So that was tough. But um Yeah. Uh and then on the left we got Sepultura and I definitely see some, you know, arise Michael Whalen you know, references there with the crustacean arms. Yeah, man, that was fully like in inspired by Whalen's work, man. Like it's just such a sick cover. Um and then just yeah, really just saying can we do like an, an arise theme t shirt? Obviously I couldn't be too on the nose. Just because of legalities with you know Max Cavalier and the rest of the guys. Um, okay. Yeah. And uh, but yeah, I think I tied it in quite well. Obviously, I was very attuned to the color scheme that was in Arise. Um, the one thing I really wanted to use was the uh, yeah, like the sort of the crab arms and the weird sort of soul nectoplasm. That's something I just thought was so striking in that cover. Uh, and obviously some totem poles and sort of cact is it cactus or cacti from Brazil, um, just to tie in the indigenous uh, vibes. But yeah, that was pretty fun, man. Like kind of just approaching it from just having having that image in the middle in the background, but needing something to break it up. Like I I don't like cutting a scene or anything for a t-shirt i like to have stuff in the foreground that actually breaks it up dynamically and frames the piece in that sense mm -hmm. rather than just having like a background there and just fading it out um yeah no no shade on people that do do that it's just for me i've never it just it doesn't sit well with my own stuff um so again just contorting bodies like neoclassical style like lots of different angles um really like wanted to add the forced perspective um 
Which I kind of realised, actually, when you look at neoclassical art, there isn't a lot of false perspective. I think that's something that came out later in the 20th century, you know, like where things were a bit more um, experimental, I guess. But I think yeah. I think it still works, though. You know, I think it still has that classical... Like, like it's, it's like you are talking earlier, the, the way you draw faces and the flow of the arms and stuff definitely is classical. Thanks, like, you're not, you're not like, looking up... Pictures of contemporary model faces, female or male. When I look at the faces of your work, it definitely looks like, you know, Da Vinci, you know, style mm. faces and stuff, which is cool. That's the best compliment, dude, because that's something I, I just really want to try and maintain throughout all my work. Is I just, yeah, I've always just loved neoclassical like sculptures, and I think just growing up in London in the city, you know, you do see all this really ancient sort of. Um, or not ancient, but, you know, classical architecture and sculptures, statues. Um, they've always just made a huge impact on me. And um, I think I touched on it before, but actually learning just lighting and form did come from statues. And it's actually a really good way of using reference, I find. Yeah. Because it's fully formed, it's got the lighting there. But obviously, you might not be able to reimagine the lighting because you're going by reference. But that was another really big way of how I learned um, form, you know, figure drawing. It's a good point. It's a really good point. Yeah, I kind of, I was chatting to another artist friend. He was like asking me for an advice and he was asking about reference. And it didn't really click until I said that to him. I was like, oh, actually, like, I think statues is probably the best way that I learned, really. As well as obviously, because comics, you know, it's, it's, um, it's graphic, right? It's not, it's not always going to be um, grounded in reality in terms of lighting and shadow. So... I find when you've got a statue, it's kind of all there established for you. Um, just as I know some artists, they use a lot of photos of themselves, you know, like making sure they've got a light in a certain area and then, um, you know, then emulating it in a piece. I think that's that's really good as well. Don't tend to use Primarily that. what I do when I'm trying oh, to do yeah. something like that. Yeah. I know like, uh, you know, Alex Ross, comic book artist who works like in gouache and more Famous like a painterly stuff. Yeah. Fame, yeah, he uses photo reference, right? Yeah, and it's pretty much all himself. You know, some people critique him, but it's like, well, try doing anything like what he does. And it, the thing I love about him above everything else, like, I do like, you know, comic books and superheroes to a certain degree. I'm not like, I'm not like a diehard like Marvel fan or anything. I just like the aesthetics. But um, mm. with him, I like that he's like painting kind of like, you know, 1950s-esque kind of style yeah. and then he's using gouache um, and I like watching him paint and just kind of piece it together because you know gouache is a you know medium that a lot of people used back in the day but isn't quite as popular now so it's cool seeing somebody at that caliber using a medium like that 100% man and it's like you say um, using gouache but it's still being so defined I mean it's almost like it looks like watercolor almost you know but everything's yeah. just so chiseled and uh, yeah I've heard people kind of critique and say you know even the like his women look like him <laughs> which is kind of funny. <laughs> That's funny but you know not necessarily dude like like you say you try and do that it's tough man like you know yeah. it is um I'm the same as you I'm not really big on Marvel and even DC I was always into the more of the independent comics and um, like actually, two. I don't know if you've read many uh, British comics like 2000 AD. No, man, I think you'd like it because it's just way darker, super intelligent. There's none of that sort of damsel in distress kind of iconic, you know, sort of story or characters. They're all very flawed, super dark. Lots of sci-fi and dystopia, really gritty. I mean, like Judge uh, Dread and stuff like that. That's that's 2000 AD. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, like Brian Boland, he did a lot of that art. I like his style a lot, man. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is, like, I, it's not that, I mean, I like the storytelling in comic books, but what I, what I found is the best storytellers aren't the best artists, and the best artists aren't the best storytellers. When you get that combo, that's when you Very get, true. like, a really good book. So mm. sometimes I'll just buy stuff just purely for the aesthetics, but I don't really care about the story. I'm just studying it, just looking at the images. <laughs> You know, like just frankly, I'm, I'm exactly the same. Like I must come across like so just shallow. But I mean, I won't get a comic. I won't buy a comic unless the interior art is at least kind of good. You know? Yeah. 
like this is uh, I got it on my stand here underneath the oh, stand. I just lifted the mic up a little so it could pick me up. But dude, the French artist like Mobius and then Jouet, this is the stuff that has Man, been I love me Mobius so much. I need to get that. Is it is just a collection of his work? This is Jouet. So this is uh, one of the other guys who founded Heavy Metal Magazine. Oh, cool. Probably by the time this is out, I have a, an episode out where I'm on a, a panel with some other, you know, heavy art talk uh, guest, and we talk a little bit about Jouet, but dude, what he's doing, uh, it, it, it's kind of hard to show and do this, but mm-hmm. what he's doing is, it's definitely uh, very similar to what I want to try to accomplish with my, with my work, so I've been drawing a lot from him, and um, you know, I don't want to rip him off, but like, I just think that like, what he's trying to achieve is is very akin to what I'm trying to do. It's nice I'm, seeing those artists, you know, where it's like they're different enough, but they kind of show a path of another possibility for you to explore, you know? And is, would you say the story is well written as well then, or would you say that's kind of a compromise? Compromise. Would you write really? for yeah. sure? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's not that they're bad, but I, I, I just – it's almost distracting. The art is so good that I don't want to read it. <laughs> I just want to look at the next page. Right. What's it and called like, again? I'm going to make a note of this. So the artist's name is Philippe Jouet. This is uh, your Gail Erm. This is a 1974 Dragon's Dream. So Roger Dean. This is one of oh, his wow. presses. Uh, so this is a very old book, but they just recently um, did the uh, <clears throat> uh, like a reissue of some of his Lone Sloan series. Mm. Like if you look at this, I mean, let's just let's just be real. I I know this is my like scratch page, so it looks really messy, you know, handmade art, right? But you can kind of see. Oh, 100 percent, dude. Yeah, I'm trying to do my own version of what he's doing in this piece, and you know, you can call me out on it if you want, but I think there's enough difference uh, to it. 100% 100% but, dude like you know we all it's like music man like it's all been done before at the end of the day we're all just kind of um soaking this stuff up and you know it's uh, I'm glad you mentioned Mobius as well man like Jean Garrard's Mobius is just such a huge inspiration as well like his yeah. his um just character design um and just landscapes that he does but the really trippy psychedelic colors that he uses like have you seen a he's done a spider-man and a iron man uh piece yeah. dude so those are sick. so good yeah and he's a very versatile artist man mm. you know you know it's him but some stuff is really sketchy and quick and yeah. some of it's like really really developed like that the, the spider-man afraid. yeah so cool. Yeah, I got a. Uh, I'm not sure if I have it to hand, but he did a uh, Silver Surfer comic, like one shot. Mm-hmm. Uh, all him interior artwork, and it's just so done. And it's a bit more of the sort of the rough, quick stuff. But I know you're talking happy. about. And it's got uh, Ultron on it, right? Oh, so th- there's one that has a cover with Ultron and then Silver Surfer. No, it's Galactus. Galactus, I'm sorry, I didn't mean Ultron. I was getting them mixed up. Oh, yeah, no, that's Galactus, cool. yeah, 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 yeah. It's oh, like all-time favorite comics, man. And it, to be fair, the story is actually really good as well. But the artwork yeah. was just amazing, like pa- like almost pastel colors, but just the way he just draws stuff and the, just the movement and emotion in the face is like so amazing, so good. Yeah, we can nerd out all day. All right, <laughs> yeah. let's, let's bring it home. So we got. Um, cool. This is what your second most recent piece, or one of your most recent ones. This is my most recent piece. Yeah, I've like kind of started one like in between just pencil, but yeah. So yeah, concubine. Tell me about it, man. Yeah, so it'd been a while. I mean, bef- uh, before this, I think my last piece was summer last year, man, uh, which was the other piece you showed. Woe at the mattress side of Gaia. So, uh, you know, the woman with, with the, the yeah. yeah. Um, and that was a really good, successful print run. Um, and yeah, it had been so long, man. Like I, uh, kind of personal work had taken the back burner for a long time. Uh, and you know, obviously I've got bills to pay, right? So it just, it was taking up most of my bandwidth, but yeah, I really wanted to just do something again for myself. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, it's, I've kind of included everything that I love. So I mean, you've got kind of hawky-esque smoke in the back. Um, just Filigree, too. 
Thanks. Yeah. Filigree, I, I've done a piece before. It was a really big commission piece uh, called Father Father Time or Father of Time. Um, I saw that one. Yeah. Yeah. Nice one. So it had this really big monolithic thing. And I realized that that was something that I've always wanted to do and include in my work. Because again, like as I said, when we started, I've always loved kind of filigree and that ornate sort of cursive um, sort of accents in work and or components or whatever. Um, for some reason, it just just lit my mind for a lot of personal pieces until recently. So I'm going to try. Yeah, and I, yeah I'm, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna poke a little fun at you in a good way. But if okay. I was doing shindy bingo, are there talons? Is there a crescent moon? <laughs> is, is, yeah. is there a neoclassical yeah. figure? There you yeah. go, dude. You love the talons, man. I, I love see that talons, on. dude. I actually, I really want to change my name from Shinji Design to like something fucking talent, but like I don't know. I, I just love it. Uh, I don't know why the moon and, and maybe moon and talent. I've just figured out my new name, bro. I don't know, man. Sh Shinji Design it rings off though, man. Really? Damn. Everyone says that. My girlfriend says that as well. I was like, I want to change my name to, to this, and she's like, no. Oh. Like, well, you got your name in it, and that's helpful, you know. And there's yeah. not. I don't know anyone else named Shindy. And I, I mean, you know, it's like a nickname for you, right? It is a nickname, like, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know, man. Yeah, it's <laughs> totally my sort of my motifs, you know, is uh, talents and moons. But yeah, I wanted to just do something, obviously for me, but I wanted to kind of focus on the idea of um, con like a, a concubine. And, and well, I suppose, again, that's another thing you could add to the Shindy Bingo is like a siren, right? Like a... Um, yeah of a mythological character with a female sort of power to it. Um, I've just always been drawn to, like, the, the female form. Um, like, I, I was brought up by my mum, so I'm very in touch with, like, my feminine side. I've just always um, just loved con contrasting beauty with dark, obviously. Oh, yeah. um, so I wanted something to kind of show that these, like, good and evil alike is, like, just enthralled by this siren or this uh, this concubine um, and just wanted it to be, like, you would... You'd be attached to this this goddess, you know, no matter what. Like, even if your world was burning around you, you'd still be clinging on, you know, for dear life. That was basically just the idea. Um, and I was just having fun with this, man, like, just trying to get back into dot shading again like again with commissions i don't get to do it as much just because of time constraints i'd probably have to charge you know a good a good bit more than what i did if, I, if it was just hashing i can hatching i can kind of get through quite quick um yeah. and i can sort of bang stuff out in good time and hit deadlines but with dot shading it takes so much more thought and just delicate process um so yeah i just kind of wanted to get back into just to, to doing something for me man and um, I, even with this, I would change a lot for sure. Um, just the the line weight, and I kind of I actually prefer the color. Usually, I I prefer the black and white, and I like my ink work to, like I said before, do most of the leg work. You know, carry most of the weight, and then the color just be uh, accentuating certain uh, aspects of it. But yeah. with this, I, I find the color is is better i think in my sense in in my in my mind it kind of everything's distinct um and i know what you mean i, I mean i don't it's decipherable you know like you can tell yeah you know i've lightened up the wings and the cloth and everything it's just everything's got its place like i find the black and white the filigree in the background just looks like a bit of a mess and it's a bit lost Perhaps to me, to me, it's, it's still it's still more readable than than a lot of black and white art that I see that is very busy. But in this case, I can see your point though. I think using like those brown cloaks that just breaks everything up, like mm. you're talking about, and the fact that the skull uh, or the skeleton, you know, has a different you know shade of color than the the skin tone, so it obviously breaks it out too. Mm. But I think they're both really strong. Thanks so much, dude. I'm glad you picked this one out. I'm, um, I do, I do like this one. Like I say, it's always tough for me to take compliments, but this is where I, you know, it, like I say, it'd been a long time since I did a personal piece, so I was just like, I don't care what's going on in my life. I need to dedicate some time to myself, and just I don't care how long it takes. I'm just going to do it. And 
I've yeah, I'm definitely going to make a point of doing more personal work because um, yeah, you, you can get burnt out easily if you're just doing commissions and you're just realizing other people's ideas. It can just get exhausting after a while, and it's no. It's not to say that I don't enjoy the work. It's just you've got to have that balance, right? You've got to have that uh, equilibrium. Well, the other thing, too, is like anytime you do a personal piece, it's showing the world both in album and band work. But I think you'll especially find it with tattooing once you get more up to steam, you know. It shows what you want to draw, and over time, people will come to you for that. You know what I mean? Like that's mm. why artists, tattoo artists, you know, create flash and create things like that. Cause it's like, this is the type of work I want to create. So, That's right. mm. you know, I think, I think it'll benefit that too. So you don't fall into the trap of, you know, tattooing work that you don't enjoy as 100%. over time, you mm. got to pay your dues, of course, you know? Oh yeah, but, sure. But I think that's the other strength of always doing personal work. 100% dude, you've got to do it. Like, I mean, I think it was in one of your notes in your questions about how how you juggle time, you know, how you actually fit in uh, personal work. And I've got to admit, I've been terrible at it over the years. You know, I've literally, like I say, I've uh, commission work has been paramount. Um, and I would get burnt out quite a lot. And um, so now I, I'm trying. It's not as easy, obviously. You kind of you think you can fit in time, but I'm going to try and do like one day a week. I'm just going to dedicate just for me, just even if it's just sketching stuff out. One day a week, regardless, is going to be for like personal work, and then uh, hopefully, or then I'll be recharged enough, and you know, it will actually it actually helps you with your commission work. I find because you are recharged and you're doing something totally different, and you're not. You know, you're not like, oh, I'm doing a cover again with the same sort of themes, you know? Yeah, totally, man. Well, let's bring it home with final question. Um, what would be one piece of advice you would give to somebody who wants to create art in the music scene or just illustration in general? Wow, this is always really tough, man. Um I think you could break it down into sort of different sections, not to like ramble for too long, but so I say, you know, the business side of things, and this is something I've just learned over time is just have everything in writing, you know, like stick to your guns, um, watermark your work until they've paid for it, man. Like I didn't learn that until way late and I've had people literally not pay for work and just, do a runner, you know, like literally just disappear. Um, yeah, just have everything in writing, establish everything from the get go. So you know what you're doing. So there's no like tweaking that they're not paying for and stuff like that. Um, just be you do a good job of doing that on your website. I noticed. Oh you're, yeah. You're very transparent about your rates and your mm. process. hundred percent, man. That's only going to just help um, you and help clients understand whether they can afford you, you know? So yeah, but that's the business side of things. Um, there's obviously the creative side of things, which is, you know, just do what you love doing. And I know it sounds cliche and it's hard to, to do that when you're doing this to earn a living. You know, sometimes you've got to bend uh, to a certain degree and you've got to take on commissions that, you know, you might not necessarily like, but you need to pay the bills. That's absolutely fine. But establish your own style um spend time on personal work no matter what like even if you are just doodling like once you're doing this full time just make sure you spend time on yourself um and just always try and stay inspired man like you have to be obsessed about this to do a good job and you have to be obsessed to make it into a living you know if you're just doing it as a thing where you think oh i could make some money out of it you're not going to be driven enough to do what i do which is get up early every day five days a week you know do eight hours straight every day no matter what no matter how i'm feeling or whether i'm ill or whatever you know you've got to be obsessed about it. you've got to love it to do that i think um i've got to, i feel like i have to mention the social media side of it because i find it so tied into what we do as creatives nowadays like you just can't escape it and um it requires a lot of self-awareness and checking yourself um you know to paraphrase you earlier uh 
you know, it's good to get a following and it's good because you're exposed to so much art and peers and friends and stuff like that. But I think you need to remember that how many likes you've got and how many followers you've got, it doesn't matter, man. You've just got to focus on the work itself. You know, you've just got to work on yourself and just, you know, turn your phone off every now and then, dude. Like, if you get fed up, like, go for a walk and just explore the outside, you, you know life doesn't revolve around instagram and facebook like it's it's destructive dude like there's been times where i'm just scrolling there for hours and thinking i'm being inspired but i'm not i'm just being distracted and i'm i'm actually hating myself and my work even more because you're comparing yourself to these other artists or like you know if you're an in, if you're like a, a musician these virtuosos or if you're a you know, like a model, you're comparing yourself to these influences and it's not real. It's just, it's so fake. It, a lot of the time it's just, it's bought likes and bought followers, you know? So just know that social media is important, but just focus on the work, man. Like be pragmatic about it. Know how to use social media, you know, you learn how to utilize technology in a healthy way, but just don't make it the be all end all, man. Like, who gives a fuck if you posted a, a piece and it had like half as many likes as the previous piece, man? Like, just don't dwell on it. Just focus on yourself, man. Yeah. Sorry for that. No, no, that's a good point. Like, the other thing is like, don't, don't try to convince everyone that you're this great artist. Just try to create great art by enjoying it. Mm. You know, I think so much of it is trying to it's like you're trying to like fool people that you're bigger than you are. That was what, you know, if I look back, I guess they're still going on today. But, you know, when I used to be in a band, that was part of it. It's like try to make yourself look bigger than you actually are. Whereas right. I think it's more of just, like you said, man, enjoy the process. Enjoy the art that you're creating. And, um, yeah, don't try to be somebody else. Like you have to find that well of like what truly is you and then try mm. to – prove it over time so i won't dude. try to be you you won't try to be me we can just do our <laughs> own thing and just get better right perfect dude yeah that's it all right shindy well stay on just for a second but for everybody else thank you for tuning in um like i said about three episodes a month uh please check out shindy design on instagram you can check out his website uh sometimes he has like prints coming up i think they're all sold out currently which is a good sign um, but yeah, keep an eye out whenever he posts. And if there's anything uh, involving like prints, man, you got to pick that up because it's going to look great on a wall. Um, even, your, even your mom's going to like it to a certain degree, you know? So. Maybe. May, may, may you have too many boobies in there. We'll see. But thanks. Yeah. Thanks much, dude. For the open-minded I mean. mothers out there. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, thank you, everybody. Oh, go Sorry. Ahead. Hey, thanks uh, for having me on, dude. It's been really great. Um, I love what you're doing with, you know, platforming artists and just having a cool conversation like your interview style is just really laid back and chilled which is awesome like really enjoyed everything like riddick and sawblade and nightjar i can't wait to see more and um yeah thanks dude really appreciate it appreciate it see you guys thank you Out.